just a just a hair. Okay. So we're like that. That's yeah. it. That's all it. Right. All right. Easy cool. enough, right? Yeah. Not bad at all. Ricky B in the house. How you doing, man? Man, I am great. Thanks for having me do this. Yeah, man. Uh, so for those who aren't watching the YouTube version, this is the first in-house uh, interview. I have an interview this Saturday that's going to be in here as well. And I also have an interview lined up for the next three weeks that will be in here. So local people only. Awesome. I'm awesome. excited. Yeah, so I'm happy to be the guinea pig here. Yeah, dude. Uh, so it's uh, Ricky found out that it's very warm in my house in this one particular small room. I don't have blinds on the window, and uh, there is some very nice, uh, what would you call that, press styrofoam? Yeah, no, it's classy. It's uh, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> warm is it's it's a it's a relative thing because you know I've been I've been hot since '89. No, oh. so, like, we, we always keep the house very cold. And, yeah. You know, so we're all a little different, I guess, but yeah. it's not bad at all, really. Yeah, well, dude, I'm so thankful. I'm thankful that you're a local guy. It worked out really well. I had no idea that we were only like 20 minutes apart. Me too. So uh, I met you back, I don't know, probably last fall for the first time. Um, I met you at Hubert's. Yeah. We went right at uh, Hubert from Nitro Circus. We rode at his house. Um, other than that, I think I've seen you around here and there, obviously on social media. Um, but tell me about yourself. Who are you? What do you like to do outside yeah. the sport? Uh, well, um, that's kind of hard to say because I kind of live and breathe the sport. You know, I mean, off fat off roading. When I mean, I remember being a little kid going off roading with my dad in, in the hills of Alabama, and you know, I kind of I kind of picked it up from there. Did a little bit of BMX and mountain biking, but aside from that, it's been off roading, whether it be a Jeep or a Razor. Or, buggy otherwise it's always been some something about off-roading even my vacations now i take my poor girl and we'll, <laughs> we'll go on vacation right yeah well vacation is jeep beach in daytona yeah or vacation is jeep invasion at you know gatlinburg or whatever so yeah. i i can't always really i can't seem to find myself away from it so let me ask you this we'll just jump right into it i was at the beach last week and i first off had to deal with like crazy horse flies at the beach one of the worst experiences, I think I ended up spending like a hundred to 150 bucks in just like pest spray and it doesn't work. That's the worst part is it doesn't work. If you're going to the beach, you need to take one of those like dig in things like the bags. And that's what apparently that's the only thing that will actually stop. Really? Awful. Really like ruined two days of my vacation. I huh. was very upset. I, yeah, I'm not much of a beach guy. I don't know okay. anything about the beach. Really. Okay. So no, I, there you go. Hey, fun fact. Uh, I'll add so, it to the list. What? is taking your Jeep on the beach like? Because they let you drive on the beach and at Jeep Beach, right? So so Daytona, yeah, that's and that's my compromise to going on a, on a beach vacation, okay. right? I wanted to do something <laughs> that I wanted to, let's go to the beach, sure. I'm just yeah. gonna take my Jeep casually. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's pretty cool. I actually went, man, the, so the timeline of this interview is gonna be all over the place. That's, it's how these go, <laughs> it's how these go. I guess why I got paper here, just to keep us somewhere on track. So I went to the beach to take Daytona Beach for the first time on the Ultimate Adventure. Okay. Um, what year? God, 2014, wow. maybe. It's so funny that that's like a long time ago. That's like a long time It feels, ago. yeah, it feels like a long time ago. <laughs> you know, anything pre-2020 yeah. feels like a long God, time ago. It's a fact. But uh, no, so I went there on Ultimate Adventure. I was a photographer for the magazine at the time. Um, lucky, you know, right time, right place. But uh, Got to go out on the beach. I was passenger, so I didn't have my own vehicle, but I got to experience it for the first time. Got to, I didn't even see that ocean before this trip, so it was my wow. first time to, to be on the coast. And yeah, it was a really cool experience. So I was like, when I heard about G Beach at Daytona, I was like, man, I got to go. Let's, let's add that to the list. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, is it like as mall crawler ish as it seems sometimes? Because it's I, probably more mall. Crawler okay. Than it seems. Okay. Because I my favorite thing is the like consequent. Um, it's like social media videos that we get after like people getting stuck in the sand and stuff like that. So I, I, for those who don't know, I don't know if you know, I actually come from like Jeeps. That's my okay. background. When I was 16, my parents bought me one and it was like an old 2003 TJ. I put a four and a half inch rough country lift on it and thought it was built like in the story, thought it was done. And I ended up buying that 98 TJ that had tons under it and like 37s. And I had buddies who had razors and like, not only did they, you know, they could go faster than me, but like, I was just, it was just slow. It just seemed so slow. And I was like, oh, it's because I haven't built 
a, an expensive Jeep yet. So I built a two door JK with coilovers and the whole nine yards. <laughs> Obviously didn't do anything I wanted it to do. Didn't have lockers. Was on a Dana 30. It was a bad decision. Sold that. Now with the razors. But I wanted to ask you um, to roll it back a little bit. Tell me about the photography thing. Because for a long time, I saw your watermark and had no idea who you were, what you were. Saw you in the magazines. And it's crazy to think that, like, I have you here now. It's wild. Well, I, I, I mean, I... <sighs> Golly, how does it all start? So when I started Ricky View Photography, it really came from going off-roading with my dad in an off-road club, mm -hmm. Central Alabama Off-Road Society. I remember it like it was yesterday. I just picked up a camera. I was 13, 14 years old, picking yeah. up a camera. It was right when digital photography on the internet was a thing. There was no YouTube. Yeah. Uh, photo bucket. I was embedding. Oh, good. That's, so that's the MySpace era. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So like I was embedding photos on the local off-road forum and mm -hmm. I would go and I was the official club photographer. And then it kind of spiraled from there into, I went to Blue Torch Fab used to be in Dothan, Alabama. Yeah. And just from being on the forums and being active on the forums, I befriended Dan DuBose. Moto Build now. Uh, Moto Build okay. now. And I defend, uh, I befriended Lance Clifford of Pirate 4 by 4 Somehow, I don't know exactly how that timeline worked out. It might have all just fallen together. But I went down to Dan's shop for a fab stop, shot some photos for Pirate 4 by 4 and got an opportunity to work with Crawl Magazine that same weekend. Yeah. And it just snowballed from there. So I was really fortunate to be presented with some some good opportunities. What was the first shoot you did for crawl? Because because for those who are more razor guys and not full size buggy like Jeep guys, crawl is it? Like right. that's the one Jeep you want to work with. Crawl, yeah. And at the time too, <laughs> crawl was the top. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was they would shoot the most popular, top of the line only builds. It yeah. was just high end, high end competing, high end builds. You know, now it's you know they got a lot of Jeep stuff and trail rides. It's more you know general public. And, sure. And honestly, you kind of go that route to stay, stay relevant right yeah, yeah. but um no the first shoot i did was that was fully me i think was wide open designs ubicon and uh it was actually adam woodley built it for a guy called uh, we call him uncle bob okay and this was 2016 17 yeah um and uh we went downtown Birmingham, found a graffiti wall. Like it was, I know this shoot. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. That's all yeah, it took. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we did that. Um, I was shooting though. The weekend that I was the fab stock thing was, uh, uh, golly, we had pimpin' ain't easy. The old yeah. tube chest. Oh yeah. Cab truck there. And, yeah, yeah. um, so I shot a little bit of that, but my first ever shoot was that, that Ubicon. Dang. And, uh, from there I organized, uh, I got more involved in the magazine. I organized the, uh, I did this thing called the Tennessee Media Run, okay. where we got, um, man, this is way back. <laughs> so again, because I was just so involved in this industry, I knew a little bit of everybody. Mm -hmm. So the Ricky B photography thing was picking up momentum at this time. So I knew all the Cole Works guys. Yeah. Uh, I was really good buddies with that Woodley Wide Open Design. Mm -hmm. So this like high end Southeast rock bouncer world that was just starting, I was friends with all those guys. Yeah. So I organized this ride where we went to, I think we went to Woolies. We went to Mount Etna at the time outside Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. um, we may have gone a third location, but I can't remember. But anyway, that was the weekend of the famed Fat Girl Wheelie. So wow, I don't know if you remember. Yeah. That oh, dude, cameras. how can you how can you not like that is ingrained in the, like the rock bouncing history is one of the most iconic moments. So that that was a pretty cool right there. Um, when I was kind of building my momentum, organizing that, getting those guys together. That was a heck of a group of guys that weekend. Yeah. And, uh, you know, kind of some rock bouncer history was made there. I would have to agree with you. So, so let me ask you, and this kind of goes, I mean, deeper into the interview that I wanted to, but look at rock bouncing right now. What do you think? And we'll, we'll talk about the actual leagues and the races and stuff like that. But, you know, when you started that high end rock bouncing community, even the rock bouncers themselves were far primitive to what we have now. So what did you think then? Did you think it was ever going to be what it is now? Man, you know, I love what it is now. Sure. I mean, it's very competitive. It's, it's all about racing and, and high end parts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it's pushing the limits of the industry. Yeah. And I think that's what the coolest thing about rock bouncing is 
you know, okay, I need a better shock. So they're taking technology from desert racing. They're putting it into the, the, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. cool. Don't get me wrong. But something about when it was first started, it was a pretty small close knit group. Mm -hmm. And those guys were just buddies and they were building what they thought was cool because they wanted it. And, you know, to see the evolution come from that, it's so different. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, that's still that core of wanting, wanting to do their own thing. Like yeah. you still see guys that are trying to be different. Yeah. Just, just because, and then explore the industry a little bit. But Well, that's what makes, you know, like there's some people who, uh, like I always pick on Anthony on, he's always trying to do something different. And I really like that. I really appreciate it. Um, and then you have guys like the reject fab crew who their thing is performance. They are just performance, performance, performance. And they, I mean, this weekend at blue holler, uh, watching Danny Smith climb that hill, dude, that guy got in the car, like, a, like, I don't want to say psycho in like a bad way, but like he was, he was dialed, you know, and, and it, it, it's just, it's gone in like from the time that I saw it to now, it's so much more uh, profession. Like you have a job. I, I think that's a good point that you mentioned about performance because mm -hmm. that I think is how rock bouncing evolved. It's evolved into performance. Mm -hmm. And back then, 2007, uh, yeah, 2007. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's, that's um, 13 years ago. <laughs> so, Back then, um, it was like fit and finish. I mean, they were doing all these crazy dad. Bondo was involved in some of the, the tube chassis, like body fillers. Like it was all molded into one piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was a lot. It was like a, a show car okay. getting thrashed. I get it. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you had the uh, what was what was it like the equalizer, which recently got sold. Um, which was an Equinox front end, but it's yeah. all just okay. yeah, beautifully yeah. That's done. That's the Mercedes front end? Uh, it was like a Chevrolet. Chevrolet. Um, oh, okay, got so it. They had, got a, they it. had a Cadillac. Yeah, they did yeah. 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 a Cadillac one that yeah. was so great. Um, man, there's so many I'm forgetting, I'm sure. But like, Coleworks really had that iconic like body shell style. The where double B hoop, beautiful. man. That's where I feel like beautiful. it came from, too. Amazing. You know? yeah. the, the highlight colors, the yeah. double B hoop, like that was... To me, back then, that was the core of rock bouncing. Was, yeah. Or the double tube frame. That so, was... so that is the that that to me. Uh, there's a lot of guys out there who have rock bouncers and all this and that. And they, some of them have ditched the, the the double tube frame down the bottom with just the inserts. And even when I see, <coughs> excuse me, um, like RC rock bouncing, I see guys who don't don't incorporate that. You know, and they have you know you have skids and stuff like that. But I mean. When you look at like a Showtime replica and like an RC car, dude, you got to have it because it's just that iconic well, yeah. piece of structure. But, but yeah, you I know what? It's, yeah. it's performance. It's evolved it's past that. So yeah. it doesn't have that same look and feel that it used to, but it still is the same concept. So mm -hmm. I get it, you know. I get it. I get it too, but I know what you're saying. I miss, well. hey, I miss a whole bunch of unnecessary brightly colored tube. Yeah. You know? <laughs> now, now this bleeds over into like your own experiences. Did you ever have a rock mounter? Never did. Did you ever have like Jeep with big cage, things like that? My dad and I built uh, a 97 TJ on one tons, 42s, stretched, big old, big old you know, <laughs> so like that, that was probably as big of a rig as I ever had. Mm -hmm. um, and it was fun, but it was a rock crawler. Yeah. You know, it was some Atlas, you know, manual transmission. It wasn't, yeah. I, I don't know, something about, don't get me wrong. I would love to be able to hit Cable Hill at 40 miles an hour. I don't know if I would, <laughs> but, but at you know the time of my life, I'm only now to the point where I could afford the consequences. Yeah, and now I'm past the age of wanting the consequences, so I'm in this weird zone. Dude, of like, no, I, I just it. don't have the heart. These guys have so much more heart and passion than I do for that particular aspect of off roading. I feel like know? that's that's a piece that I miss all the time is when you say like heart and passion because. I looked at DC Thompson in the eyes as he was like getting ready to go up this hill. And I looked at him and I, I think I even said to somebody, I was like, there is crazy in those <laughs> eyes. Like you could, you can just see it in DC. You DC is a little wild anyways, but you, you know, I always looked at it as like recklessness, but it really, it really is passion. Yeah. And if everybody's built a little different too, That's true. What, it, what it takes to get your, you know, the juices flowing, if yeah. you will, yeah. you know, to get excited about something that everybody's both a little different. Me, I, I could rock crawl all weekend yeah. long and have a great time and be exhilarated. But, you know, 
Sure. I'm just a little different, I guess. So you have you have your stretch TJ on 42s, and and now uh, you have your JK, your four door JK on 40s. Man, yeah. Okay. So it's, tell me about it. What's the comparison? What do you think? Yeah, the evolution of my trail riding has been so crazy over the years because it's kind of gone back full yeah. circle. Yeah. So you know, started with the the Jeep with my dad, got my own Jeep, built it. The Jeep was more of street legal it was grand cherokee built that got rid of the grand cherokee got a razor 800 rode the race 800 the 800 was great for the photography thing you really know, like you said it, it, jeeps are slow yeah so okay. like when Perfect. i was getting getting big into the photography thing i would jump in the razor it was like me and cole shirley we'd take off <laughs> and, and razors and yeah matter 11 yeah and uh we'd take off in our razors and see everybody who park at the top of the hill walk down shoot it you yeah know, it's really easy so did that for a while um, they got a Razor 1000, built it with wide open design. Yep. Um, then I decided I went to a Jeep event after having Razors for years. Yeah. I was like, man, I, I can do this. Mm -hmm. let's, let, let's get a Jeep. So I bought a Jeep Rubicon and then proceeded to take everything Rubicon out of it and rebuild it. <laughs> and, As they all do. And, yeah. So <laughs> As now, you should. Now I got a way overbuilt, what I would consider to be kind of an adventure Jeep. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily a rock crawler or mm -hmm. a, hill killer and it definitely doesn't go down the interstate very good anymore but you know right in the sweet spot <laughs> it's, it's perfect it's just inconvenient enough to drive yeah on the interstate that it makes it an adventure yeah yeah that's good i like i said in my jeep days i had i had a, I had a death wobble experience coming back from golden mountain one time i wheeled it at golden mountain and thought i could drive it back and it was just like that was enough to jarringly like scare me where I was like, I'm going to die if this happens at the wrong time. So anyways, I decided to get rid of that, but, um, I'm a big fan of the Jeep stuff. I, I personally, um, it's like taboo to say it, but I was a big fan of like the way of life guys for a really long time. It, and it's just because they were the first ones putting out, uh, like long distance trail Jeep stuff for the longest time. And I didn't, you know, we, we just don't seem to have that out here in the East Coast until I discovered Windrock. And I want to hear about Windrock from the Razor perspective and then Windrock from the Jeep perspective, because you're up there all the time. Man, I, yeah, I've been I've been very fortunate to get a lot of wheel trips because, like I said, I like the adventure mm -hmm. aspect of it. So I've got a little group of buddies that we like to do some, I wouldn't call it overlanding sure. by any means because it's way more redneck than that although we've got one guy that's got he's got the pull out cooler and, oh, or the pull out fridge everybody's and, got one yeah he's got the rooftop belonging thing yeah but um no we did like the kentucky adventure trail yeah. and ran that from slate kentucky all the way around in half of it rather mm -hmm. um but winrock and that whole area the upper cumberland area has so much to offer you can get and it's it's uh Sunquist wildlife management area. It's a, it's a, it's a very cool area. So, um, it's cool to cover ground in a Jeep. You yeah. do it slowly and it's bumpy and you know, it's just, it's totally different, but it you is. can jump in the razor and go 75 miles in a day easily. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just it's so different worlds. It's weird that I like both of them. Yeah. I, um, I, I see the merit in both of them though, because there's, there's a sensation you get when you know you're all twisted up in a trail in a jeep and you're like man that like this is this is cool i don't i don't know how to say it per se because it's it's something about for me it's the dual purpose of the jeep sure. just to be able to drive it to the trail do the trail and drive it home there's some stress in that yeah dude but there's some reward in that too yeah um, you know we were there was a trip i'm, I'm very fortunate to be uh friends with Ian Johnson. Yeah, absolutely. The Big Tire Garage. And he invited me on a, on a trip recently, sometime last year. And it was an adventure trip. We hit a whole bunch of trails through Tennessee. Yeah. And drove the rigs. He drove his, uh, he's got a goat built tube chassis. That thing's wild. <laughs> and he drove it. And um, I drove my Jeep and we did all these trails. And I was hitting the interstate on the way home late at night after the last day. And I was like, man, that was, that was cool. This is yeah. cool that my, my Jeep was able to do it. Because you build it. It's all about choosing the right parts. Yeah. You, know, you gotta, you gotta live and learn and yeah. you know, get yeah. parts that'll hold up to it. So yeah. I'm very fortunate to be in a position and, and, you know, shameless plug, have some reliable parts in my yeah. rig. Absolutely. So. Well, that's, so, I mean, that's really what determines if you're going to make it home or not. And, and there's a lot out there at Windrock 
um, cause I've spent a lot of time out there and I, I have a couple pictures up that are from Winrock and, uh, I can't wait cause I think we're going sometime soon and it's going to look like yep. that up there. And I, I just can't wait. The fall colors are beautiful up there. They're already starting right now. Really? Uh, makes me, makes me sad cause I actually have my razor tore down right now. Um, from Diddy's big block race shop. I got oh, my yeah. shocks this week. So we're, we're trying to get a package where it's basically like a, uh, you know, better than stock valving set up where it'll actually ride comfortably. Um, a lot of times, you know, I talk on the show about having, Oh, well, this company can tune your shocks for racing really well or this and that. But, um, what I'm working with, with Chris over there is we're trying to get a setup that doesn't cost $4,000 all said and done. <laughs> and, and like, I get it, you know, you get what you pay for, but also there's some media in there. Um, I know I'm, I've worked with all things UTV to get a, a tender spring, and, and we're working on valving and then just a tender spring or valving with just the stock setup. And then I actually just ordered, uh, it should be here tomorrow. Uh, Dustin's got a, a, a full spring kit. So I ordered that. I'm going to, I'm going to give it a try. See what yeah. happens. It's one of those where I, I don't really know what's going to, what's going to happen with it. Um, I'm happy with the tenders. Tenders make such a big difference on a car, but I haven't had a car valved in like four or five years. And I'm ready. Like I'm so a huge difference. ready. It's it's such a if you've never done it before, it doesn't make sense to spend that much money because you know you'll see a fifteen, sixteen, seven hundred dollar price tag for just valving, but it's so worth it. Uh, now on your one thousand XP, you've told me time and time again that that was the best riding machine you've ever had. Yeah. Tell me about it. So, I mean, I went with the stock springs forever. They mm -hmm. sagged, then I cranked the spanners down, and you know, cranking the Spanish down, of course, makes it ride rough, but it gives you a ride height better. It's a, it's a nice Band-Aid um, for that. But I actually got with RT Pro. They had a spring kit, and it was just uppers and lowers with a, um, I don't even think they had any locking collars, so it wasn't true dual rate. I mean, yeah. it was dual rate, don't yeah. get me wrong, but it didn't have the, the stops for the second rate. Mm -hmm. And, man, I mean, I slapped it on. I didn't do anything. To so no valve. Mm -mm. See, no. now I was, I was like dead set. You were like, I was like, he did valve. For sure. No, just springs. I, I think I rebuilt them. Uh -huh. Man, I, I, I think. Did you, no. did you do it or did you have somebody else do it? I, re, I rebuilt. How was that? I, it was really easy. It was just like some seals. You just take the thing out, unscrew it off the piston. And I mean, I make it sound a lot easier than the professionals do because I was <laughs> winging it. Like I was told, you just, this is all you do. Don't do that. Yeah. And then it was already to put together, and, you know, but I, I by no means know what I was doing. Yeah. But. I think it was a seal, man. This was like six years ago. So five, six years. Cause I had that razor for six years. That's crazy. Um, and then I only got rid of it last year. Yeah. Okay. So you made the jump from 1000 XP to turbo S tell me about what were your initial thoughts? I mean, ride quality, things like that performance. So I rode with, I always was over my head on the trail with my 1000. Okay. I always picked trails that were too hard, mm -hmm. um, for the, for the machine really so i was just beating the crap out of all the time sure um you know which again shameless plug i had quality parts why it, held it, up. <laughs> so it held up i i feel bad for that razor because sure. it was on the you know it's overheated it you know i've beat it down a bunch of times and it's i've taken care of it so mm -hmm. it, it would take it again but um I was tired of feeling out guns so i finally went with the turbo s i actually bought the rcv display razor from rcv mm -hmm. um so yeah i i knew where it, you know I was, yeah oh yeah i was very happy with that <laughs> um, i the only person to really abuse it was me um but uh it's the dynamics turbo s yeah. is is worth the hype okay i mean it really is now that's the adjustment between like firms comfort things like that absolutely okay. it comes with a bunch of bells and whistles and creature comforts and navigation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely worth it. Really? I'm super happy with it. Have you been in a pro XP yet? Yeah. What do you think? They're awesome. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. I like it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd build a pro XP if it were possible. Is the hesitation based on the looks or is it just like, cause, cause I feel like social media and like the common consensus behind it is it's like a eh, kind of vehicle. Yeah. I think the Pro XP, yeah, the looks, it's just different. Yeah. I mean, people weren't, were expecting a certain look and they didn't get it. And you think, think they were looking for the K-Name? Do you think they were looking for like that look, that aggression? 
Like you know, it, is, it is similar. It is. Um, but when you sit in it, it's totally vastly different. Yes. Um, you yes, know, that, that Can-Am has that sports car feel mm -hmm. and you still have that like truck feel in, a, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, agree. I would highly agree with in that. A, in a Razor. And I, I prefer that for my kind of style riding. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, every change has a lot of people that, you know, nobody likes change. It's always kind of hard to deal with. But, yeah. So um, let me ask you this. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I, we had Polaris on and I had a little bit of conversation with Polaris. Um, a lot of that interview got, had to be censored a little bit there. <laughs> so, uh, that being said, um, I don't think you know, no one, no one's going to get mad. Uh, the pro R. The alleged, the alleged race car that's yeah. coming out, um, the the rumored car. Uh, what would you want to see? And is there any? Well, let me ask you this first. Is there anything that would make you leave your Turbo S like promptly? Promptly? Uh, I mean, financially, <laughs> finances aside. Yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> I would say that proper a proper transfer case and proper hubs. Like automotive style unit bearing or something like that okay. would would make me change. Now, when you say proper transfer case, that implies you know the whole drivetrain switch. Yeah, okay. you know, like a like a separate front and rear drive shaft situation where sure. you have a a case that's not all you know. Yeah, the transmission is is a very intimidating yes. rear diff yes. transfer case transmission all in one box. There, it's a lot yeah. going on, and if you break one part of it, you're Doing the, the whole thing, thing. the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. So, um, I think that would be cool. Yeah. Personally, I don't know what's coming. I've yeah. have speculated, but those are the th those are the two things that yeah. I would would like to see myself personally. How much power is too much power? You know, I don't think there's such thing. Okay. Um, you know, being in the drive line world, I guess we've always kind of had this attitude of bring it on. Sure. <laughs> so. I've, I've never really seen too much power. You know, you got some rock bouncer guys that were over a thousand horsepower and mm -hmm. years ago, you'd think that's completely unnecessary, but you see it be being beneficial. Well, it's the, almost the standard now, you know, you, it's very beneficial. So for a trail wheeler, I mean, I will say from my perspective, cause like I come from just off-roading. Yeah. You know? I come from an off-road club in Alabama where we're just trail riding. So my perspective of a razor guy is if you're a true off-roader, I feel like you should know how to do some trail repairs yeah. and, you should know some trail etiquette, stuff like that. But now you've got these guys jumping in a super capable machine, knowing nothing about off-roading. Yeah. And, you know, it's a little risky. It's a little tough on, on, on people and parts and mm -hmm. stuff. But, I mean, the people that know how to handle the power, there's no such thing as too much power. I would agree with that. You know, I so I wouldn't say that the machine shouldn't be the limiting factor. I think it should be the driver. So let me, uh, i got two different directions I want to go. <laughs> um, the first is going to be the speed UTV. Have you seen I have so, so yeah. Robbie Gordon's version of the Wildcat XX. Yeah. Um I am a fan of the Wildcat XX. If it had more aftermarket support, I probably would have one. Um I thought it was cool. I thought the the looks aren't the best, but <clears throat> suspension wise, technology wise, I really think it's got really neat things going on. It would be one of those that I would buy just to like, ooh, I have one. And then you know it would probably go back away. Um, <laughs> But Speed UTV is coming out, and uh, it's a fully fledged race car from the get go. I posted a video on my Instagram, and it's been floating around social media. And this car looks ridiculously fast, like like sped up video levels of fast. <laughs> so I uh, I don't know what to what to think about it to say the least. But I can tell you, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. What are your thoughts when you see something like this? You know, I like the progression. I like to see something new. I like to see somebody pushing the limits. Um, you know, the his program is very inclusive. You know, he's got his own thing. He's yeah. got his own stuff for it. It's his aftermarket program for his machine. I, I, from what I understand, at least, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of information on it. I'm really asking for knowledge here. Yeah, I don't. I don't really either. Yeah. Um, you know, we we didn't get into the program for the previous machine. Um, ourselves at, at RCV, um, you know, just demand really. Well, I mean, on top of that, it also has some very odd telescoping technology that I wouldn't think would be worth the R and D. You know, it, it, we, we learned a lot with it, but, um, yeah, man, I, I don't know. I, I don't have much to, 
to yeah. give you on that. I'm, I'm watching your <laughs> video thinking, man, that's cool. Dude, you know? <laughs> it's so fast. It's so fast. If that's, if that's a reality and, and for those who haven't seen it, just go on speed UTV on Instagram. Um, if that is a real car that can compete, it's under 999 cc's. It's pushing something crazy, some crazy amount of horsepower. Um, they there will be no one who can even stand close. Like that's how I feel about it, and it doesn't it doesn't seem real to me because it it's, it's like downloading a cheat code. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way that something is that fast. It's it's going to be unique. It's going to be interesting to see how that progresses the rest of the industry. That's exactly kind of what I want to see. I, I know that it seems the big. <laughs> The big manufacturers are a little slow around the curve, but sure. that's there's a lot that they have to do. It's true. Um, it's so true. you know, the, there really hasn't been much change, other than of course the Pro XP. That's sure. different, but um, there hasn't been much game changing technology change in, in a while. You know, the yeah, the X3 with the 180, 190, what, how 195, much 195, something like that. 190. I mean, that's pretty significant. Yeah, right there. Yeah, um, they're they're rowdy. Yeah, but uh, but like it's you know sh shows that these desert races, it's more than just power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of my that's kind of my question in asking about all the cars is uh, when I talked to Polaris, they mentioned you know all the racers like to race different cars, and and you know my question for you is not only as like an advocate and and like almost historian of the off road sport, but like as 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 part of your business, I mean it's an all around platform thing. The platform has to work, and I think that. The platforms are going to work, but I, I hope that in the future with future vehicles, uh, you know, like the Pro XB steer is awesome. I would buy one just for the steering. Yeah. The Can Am, I can't see a dang thing out of it, and and I feel like I would. I mean, if I went and trail rode that at Windrock, or if I was going trail riding at Windrock, that would probably be on my lower choices of cars to choose. It just doesn't seem like it would be the the most fun that I could have. Um, it, it's all about this all rounded platform. And I think, you know, with the Speed UTV, they're marketing it just as a race car. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm really excited for that uh, West Coast implications, but I'm excited for some guy on the East Coast to spend his $40,000, get one, and then bring it over here and dump it in a chassis and just shoot to the moon. Yeah, like, it, it'll be interesting to see what, what people do with it. I, I don't know that it'll be ever turned into a chassis. Like, I'm sure. skeptical of that for sure. Yeah. But to see it compete out in the East coast would be something I think would be good for their marketing if nothing else. Yeah. So let me ask you this too. Um, you have a nationwide clientele base and you guys are nationwide in your business. Um, West coast, East coast. Is there a delay on the East coast guys? Are we, are we behind in technology? I wouldn't say behind. I think <coughs> there is a totally different perspective of what's relevant and what's needed. Tell me what the differences might be. Um, well, you know, just the terrain dictates a lot of that, to be sure. honest with you. Um, you know, I would say that the East Coast, the, the speed factor, you know, people in the West have been going fast this whole time. It's mm -hmm. wide open. It's desert. It takes forever to get to the trail, for example. The yeah. hammers, you know, the yeah. birth of the king of the hammers is because it took so long to get from camp to the trail. Everybody would haul ass mm -hmm. as fast as they can across the desert so their trail rigs suddenly started having good suspension yeah you know so that evolved there whereas we don't really have that need um we have a desire of it i think the internet social media and everything brings it all together a little bit more but <laughs> yeah. um no i wouldn't say that, that, that the east is behind um i do think there's a greater need there's there's more four-wheeling going on in the west coast that, i mean there's more people doing it now see that that was something that uh Polaris said to me, they're like, you know, our big markets are Southwestern United States and, and the West Coast and things like that. And and I, I kind of like chalked it up to maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, and again, well, who and, am I to say that? Yeah, to I run a Polaris. <laughs> I mean, I also may not know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to that. I'm just saying my, my experience yeah. would be I see more of it. Well, I would, I would, take, I would take your opinion. Because because it's it's there's value to it and I, not to undermine. Well, and also guy. I don't know the guy that's running sure. his you know 1980 samurai in the woods of West Virginia. That's true. Know, too. He's not necessarily you know buying new product. That's true. He's still out there off road and having a good time. Yeah. So you know he's not necessarily on the radar. But um, you know the one constant of West Coast and East Coast guys is they. Are pushing the limits. Yeah, you know they buy a brand new Razor, they buy a brand new Jeep, and then they're immediately going out and tearing it up. Yeah, so that's beautiful. It's, <laughs> it's it is great. 
you know, <laughs> and it pushes the aftermarket industry. It, it pushes us to evolve. Um, manufacturers push us to evolve. I mean, yeah. the new, the Jeep JL platform and the JT, the gladiator, like that pushed us to evolve mm -hmm. the pro XP, the turbo S, the, the 195 horsepower can am. Yeah. I mean, we've, our CVs in the can am are the same CVs that we use in Dana 44, like half ton truck. That's pretty know? amazing. So, I mean, they're massive in the rear. Yeah. You know, but so still, that's amazing. So it's, it's, it's that I think combined with people just learning about it through the internet. I mean, I really think that people see stuff and they're like, I want to do that. Yeah. And then they do it, you know? I mean, what a, what a better example than King of Hammers. People, everybody on the East Coast who's, I mean, I would love to go out to King of Hammers and just run the, run the trails and things like that. But, you know, there's a part inside of you that goes, man, I would love to do that race one day. And I would love to do that. <laughs> That's amazing. And that only happens with the internet. That only happens with this kind of exposure. Uh, Tell me about your hammers experience. Have you been yet? Have you enjoyed it? So yes, um, King of the Hammers, man. I guess I need to tell you this story to tell you okay. that story. Yeah, please so, roll it back to whatever. So again, um, my first King of the Hammers was with. I was invited by Peterson's Four Wheel and Off Road Magazine as a okay. photographer. Yeah. Um, I think maybe that's not true. No, that's not necessarily true. That was part of it. Um, man, it all blurs together because at the time, I think I might've been working for, and for my, I was working at navigation advertising, which is a local Murfreesboro advertising agency. Mm -hmm. And I had wide open design as a client and RCV as a client, actually. Um, and I went out to King with hammers for something, but anyway, long story short, uh, because of Peterson's four wheel and off road, I was invited in the helicopter. So I got my first KOH oh, experience. I got to go cool. in the helicopter. Um, and, you know, at the time it had Peterson's four wheel off road slapped on the side of it and got to fly over Hammertown got to experience that. It wasn't during the race. I don't think, or maybe it was during like EMC. Yeah. Um, but man, it was an amazing experience. I think that same year I drove out there and drove back, um, with some people. So, you know, I have, I have that as like my top five off-road experiences for sure. King of Hammers. King of the Hammers. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that everybody absolutely has to experience at least once. Granted, <laughs> you may not be able to ride in the helicopter, but <laughs> I'm going to walk up to him and demand it. <laughs> Ricky but, B told me I could do this. <laughs> but at least go out. The vendor show is cool. The people, it's amazing <laughs> that you have that many like-minded individuals in the same area doing the same thing from all over the world. That is cool. I mean, you walk up to somebody from a different country and you're enjoying the same thing at the same time with them for the same reasons. Like it's, it brings everybody together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty cool. And that's, and that's kind of this industry as a whole, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll run into somebody and they'll help you for no particular reason. Dude. And it's just because they love the sport. It's, it's so interesting that the off-road community as a whole it seems to have that ingrained. I've met like one or two people that suck in the off-road world, but they, they don't come from off-road. They're not like they're, they're, you know, they're those new guys who go out by a razor and they're just like, they just jump in and pound beers and lose their beer <laughs> and all the place. Yeah. Like that, you know, that that's probably worth talking about is, is the introduction of those uh, individuals into the off-road market because it's really made it hard for like uh, land openings, things like that. You know, uh, I think that like, you know, I see stuff all the time where I have a buddy of mine who knows I'm into uh, UTVs and he sent me a message. He said, I just saw uh, some famous country music star driving down Nashville Broadway in their Can-Am. And I was like, okay. Like, and I'm just like, I feel like this is not the exposure that we want, you know, like, like, please just everyone get back in the woods and be nice to each other because uh, I have so many experiences over and over again where we've either been broke down or lost or something, especially at Winrock. And they'll just, you know, hey, you guys need a hand or anybody, everybody okay? And it's it's something that I don't think I've ever found in another, like, setting at all. But, you know, a, a friend of mine was actually just telling me a story where he was just out in the middle of the woods riding. He ran up on a guy in a, in a Toyota that broke some ball joints or whatever. And the guy was just, he was there. He was just going to live there forever, I guess. Nice. I mean, there was nothing to do. He's... <laughs> had three, three wheels on his rig and that was it. And my buddy just happened to run up on him, have exactly everything that he needed. He just, they were starting to do it. 
my buddy had some place to go. He was like, look, just take it, whatever. Yeah. You know, let me know if I can help anymore. And uh, the guy ended up finding him, tra- tracking him down, either sending him parts back or yeah. whatever. Like, dude, that's it's just, I think that impression though, because I'm assuming the guy that was broke down, same as he didn't have any parts or anything, was new. Mm-hmm. So that interaction with somebody who's experienced and prepared, I would hope would then kind of educate the new guy yeah. into, hey, this is what the off-roading community is all about. Yeah, I agree. It's, a, it's, it's an enthusiast group of, of people that care for one another and want to see each other succeed. So, you know, I, I think that stuff helps. And, and you don't get a lot of that in these big events. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've, the Jeep world, the, the full-size off-roading world is a little bit more low-key Mm-hmm. You know, it's a slower pace. You know, people are more a little bit laid back with the UTVs. They're jumping, going 40 miles an hour and stuff. Playing so. music and all kinds of stuff. So it's yeah. a little harder to yeah. stop and, and help the guy on the trail. But it still does happen, and those guys are still out there in the UTV world that yeah. do that. And I think that is important. I think it's important to to help when you can and, and you know, yeah. be a community rather than just pass the guy broke down on a flat tire and be like, man, that sucks to be him. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you a quick story. We were at Hill Mountain one time. My buddy took his Jeep down there, and uh, through a series of just really unfortunate events, uh, he had broken, he got a, a, he was on 43s or something, some big tire, and he got a flat tire, broke his front ring and pinion, broke his rear drive shaft, bent his steering, like tie rod, steering link, all of it was bent, fried his winch, and literally on the, uh, like on the side of the trail, just decided to sell the Jeep and was just done with it, just left it there. And and it was one of those days where I told myself, I probably will never do this again, like go out on the off-road world. And uh, it's it seems like those are very few and far between because maybe that guy's just unlucky because he's also a burger razor down. I don't know how it happened, but it he, he was in it and it was on fire. So he's totally fine, but it, it's it's really crazy because the, the threshold for... Um, you know the, the threshold between when you're when you're out at Winrock, when you're out at Johnson Valley, you have to be able to rely on what you've got, and and that's really kind of what I want to talk to you about is the parts that you guys make because you guys make really high quality parts. You guys stand behind your parts. Um, you guys you have a new part in yeah. here with me, and I was going to ask you about that because when it really comes down to it, saving you know that hundred two hundred bucks on an axle or, or you know a piece of part. If that's the difference between you being stranded at Winrock at night or you making it, you're limping it back to camp or whatever it may be, dude, dude. So, you know, I, I absolutely love working at RCB because I truly believe in the product. Yeah. That is, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm on the marketing side. I control all the image of RCB from a public standpoint, right? Mm-hmm. And that's so easy for me to do because I love it. So it's easy to tell people that it's great when I truly believe that it is. And, you know, we've learned so much through racing Mm -hmm. that translates to the trail riding world. Um, You know, I'd say probably our biggest market is the Jeep guy. Really? So, you know, we we make the easiest, quickest way to double the strength of your Jeep. The weakest link on a Jeep is that front U-joint in an axle shaft. That's the first thing that you're going to have issues with, no matter what Jeep you have, really. Mm -hmm. And we make an easy swap for that. And you're done. So, um, you know, and with all of our Jeep stuff, it's lifetime warranty. So we've, we've had a really That's great, nice. we've yeah. had a really great experience in that world. But we're also crazy involved in the racing side of things too. So mm-hmm. King of the Hammers, yeah, desert racing, best in the desert, uh, Baja stuff, yeah, um, rock bouncing. Um, you know, RCB and rock bouncing kind of started. That's hand in hand, in my yeah. opinion. Like, I, like I think, <laughs> man, we had so this guy named Craig Reichwald was he he worked at rcb he was like the i don't really know what his official job title was but he he did it he did he cared yeah he put in so much effort and he absolutely loved the sport of rock bouncing he loved the people he loved the, everything about it so he came in uh to one of the events um i think i maybe a guy named dean olson who still works there yeah. um, he's in charge of our production stuff now but um I think they came to a rock bouncing event. Craig fell in love with it. Um, and then they just started kind of growing it together and yeah. being a part of it. But um, I think it's a lot about relationships too. And I think that is a, a relationship that's 
benefited been mutually beneficial for sure yeah oh yeah man. Sp- the southern rock racing and yeah dude. all that but, I mean, um, yeah but anyway um that has progressed that southern rock balancing stuff has you know pushed the evolution of the sport pushed our product mm-hmm. we built the 47 spine rockwell stuff from rock balancing because yeah. there was like there's a need for more than a dana 60 so okay we'll make something more than a dana 60 and so now that's like the standard the big bell is what we call yeah, it yeah yeah and it's like the standard thing for rock bouncing um but we take all that knowledge and we're able to pass it on to non-racing applications yeah and which is like our larger markets so this the trail series has been a project i've been dying for for like three years okay um our utv program is race oriented mm-hmm. it is the top of the line it's all 300 m it's high temperature grease it's race prepped cv components so it's all like there's no binding or anything like that it's fast Mm -hmm. high speed pure abuse with that comes a price tag sure um so our trail guy that wants the best he wasn't really looking at it too much Mm -hmm. so i was like man we could make the best trail axle Mm -hmm. through a lot of deliberation and figuring it out and stuff we're finally able to make the trail series because our, our racing axle is called the pro series yeah and uh so this guy is all 4340 instead of 300 m but it's basically the same specs if you will mm-hmm. you know it's the 33 spine bar it's the same diameter bar it's the same cv setup it's just a little bit not as race oriented sure and uh I'm, I'm pretty excited about it from a personal standpoint because yeah. I'm a trail rider yeah so absolutely I have the perfect axle you know we've got this fancy powder coat on it now we're which is a, a new thing for us before we would black oxide everything, which okay. is fantastic for uh, like in your Jeep or in a desert race car or whatever, but it lacked a little longevity in the trail riding guy who doesn't necessarily want to, who doesn't necessarily maintain, you know, he might go get in the mud and park it and leave it sitting in the garage all muddy for gotcha. a few weeks. Yeah. So here we are with some powder coating that yeah. keeps it looking nice. So let me, let me tell you this for, for those who are listening, not sitting here. Uh, when he brought this in the room, first thing I noticed is, holy cow, this thing's powder coated. And not only is it powder coated, it's like show car, got a, got a little bit of gleam and glitter in there. So it's, it's really nice. It looks really good. Um, the powder coat, it, it, it's very like, it's, it's the entire thing is powder coated. So you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, your, your actual CVNs getting all crappy and stuff like that. Uh, that's one thing that I like have, I, if I'm going to spend money on an axle, I don't want to see, you know, stuff flaking off and, and like, and like, it, to me, it's one of those, I'm like, eh, now I have to think about it, you know? So I think that that was like a really good touch. And for me, it's a peace of mind thing. Um, so I do want to ask because you guys have the black boots on here. You, uh, historically, RCVs, everything's orange. Tell me about the black boots. Man, it comes down, I guess, really, it's, it's a little bit marketing. It's a sure. little bit differentiation. Um, but it's also the trail guy doesn't need the orange boot. Um, you know, the orange boot that we made isn't just an orange version of a regular boot. It's, it's completely different design. It's high temperature. It's more puncture resistant. Sure. Um, and you know, with trying to make a trail friendly axle and that's affordable, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't get the orange boot. Yeah. It gets, it gets our other, which we use the same boot in racing applications. Don't get me wrong. It's mm-hmm. a fantastic boot. It's just not their orange boot sure so. well i thought it was cool and, and and again to me it further like kind of like pro trail like yeah you have the you have the clear separation well and, i like that and you know you and i are, are probably of the opinion that the orange boot is associated with rcb but mm-hmm. somebody that may or may not be aware of who rcb is may think man that orange boot will not match my blue razor that's true too you know that's very true so there are people who are particular absolutely <laughs> absolutely you know so, so that's, that's another reason, but yeah, you know, the powder coating is, is a little differentiation here. Yeah. No, nobody else in the industry is doing powder coating like this. And I think that's kind of a nice little touch. I'll tell you, man, if I, so if I order these and, you know, I, I just expect axles, right. I'm just going to get good, high quality axles. If I pull this out and have powder coat on it. Like it, if I pulled that out of a box today, I would be probably like, Oh, look at that. that's so, like, that's so nice. Well, and you know, you don't, you, know? you can't capture this powder coat from the pictures exactly. at all. Like exactly all my marketing material just looks just regular old black yeah but 
yeah, I, I, I want to delight people and they get this, you know, we want to, we want to, uh, over, uh, I don't know. What over deliver. Mean. Exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, I think it's cool, man. I think you guys did, did a really good job. Um, I'm going to have to get me a set at some point and I'll have to <laughs> try and try and wear them out, man. Cause, uh, these are awesome. Yeah. And you know, uh, that's one of the big benefits to this obviously is we are all made in USA. Like yes, everything sir. we make at RCB, we make in a in-house in, in Rockford, Illinois. But um, this is completely rebuildable. So every single component, if you if you have a total failure, you take a hit a tree. You know, outside of the warranty, it's got a two year warranty. Okay. So you know, if you're outside that warranty period and you knock a wheel off and it damages your something, you can get just that piece. You need an inner race. That's you can nice. Get just a good inner race. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to get a whole axle, and you just you can even send this to us. We'll rebuild it or we'll send you parts. Whatever you want. Like it's it's so because we make it all. Yeah. It's so easy and flexible yeah. to get you back on the trail if something were to happen outside of the warranty. So. I'm one of those people that like you saying, "Hey, we can rebuild this for you if you want us to." I'm like, I'll bet you. <laughs> send it back. Just yeah, send, send it absolutely. back. Absolutely. <laughs> so we'll have a, we have a little system for that. Go yeah. down the website and you're done. So so in the event that somebody does need to ever. To, to warranty their product. How, what is the warranty system like for dealing with you guys? Man, you know, it's, it's really easy on the customer side because we have forms on the website. Mm -hmm. You just fill out a form. It gives us a number. We file that number away, whether we need the product back. Nine times out of 10, we don't need the product back. Okay. So we'll send you like in the full size world, if you were, you know, the full size parts are all lifetime warranty. Okay. So That's anything awesome. that fails, we'll replace it. No questions. Wow. So you know you send us a picture on this form yeah and we'll send you the product wow that's really really cool so it's it's pretty easy we've got a race program for the utv guys for the pro series mm -hmm. um where it's like a rebuild system they'll they'll send us the axles we'll service the axles and send them back yeah um you know we'll we'll do that for just our race program guys so um that's kind of separate from the the warranty sure. process but and then the trail series has its own standalone warranty program that you go to the trail series page and okay. fill out your trail series warranty. And, cool. And that's it. Cool. So. so I always like, anytime I have a manufacturer on, I like asking this question. Um, when people come to you as I'm sure they do and they say, Hey, do you guys give discounts or sponsorships or anything like that? I, I personally, I love that. I, cause I get them for some reason. People are like, Hey, do you, does the show want to sponsor my race team? And I, <laughs> every single time. Do you think I have money? <laughs> like, do you think I have, <laughs> why do you think I'm doing this podcast for <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, what does it take when you guys are looking at someone evaluating somebody, whether it be a race program or, you know, social media icons or they have their, Man, they have yeah. their value somewhere in no, there. No, absolutely. Know? That's a, that is a big question. Um, because marketing is changing. It's yeah, evolving. Absolutely. Um, we have, we have marketing partners, we have racers, we have, you know, marketing discounts where you have your social media influencers. We mm -hmm. do do that. Um, you know, we don't necessarily have a setup for it. You know, we're a small company. We're probably sure. a lot smaller than people think we are. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, our sales force is three or four guys, Yeah. you know, so, I mean, it's not like we're going across, you know, we don't have regions of sales reps and yeah. stuff like that. So, um, but we do have a lot of, I think, need for that, mm -hmm. that world. Um, cause no offense to any traditional marketing, but it's, it's kind of losing its effectiveness a little bit. I would agree with you. Um, it's, it's sad to see, especially for me coming from a magazine world, it's sad to see the, the evolution going away from, from magazine ads. I mean, I remember getting the JP magazine and yeah. through it and I'm like, man, I, I want this Warren Winch. Yeah. You know, cause the ad was so cool. Yeah. They had, had the, they had the Jeep it. throwing mud and like it's man. pulling cable. Yeah. yeah. Trust me. I'm, I'm right there with yeah. you. And I still, some of that stuff's iconic to me too. Like the Warren ad, I picture the red YJ on like 35s or 36s yeah. and winching across them. I just, I remember that the go, the go prepared across yeah. the windshield banner. So, um, but now it's a selfie video on Instagram and it's powerful. Yeah. It's amazing. The, the leverage you can have through that social media channel of just sharing it to the masses yeah. um, of like-minded people. Yeah. You know? 
you're not following somebody just because yeah. you're following them because you're interested in their opinion or what they're doing. That's, that is a crazy targeted market there mm -hmm. that you have. Um, so these social media influencers do well with that. However, I will say that there are some social media influencers are, that are not influencing anything. Yeah. But, um, you know, and that, that's a challenge in itself, especially when it comes to reviewing marketing proposals. Sure. Yeah. And that's, and, and the reason I ask is because, you know, the, the, the question is evaluating self-worth, you know, people want to say, Hey, I have this, or I have that. And, and either, you know, what am I worth or what would you guys do this? And I always ask because, um, it's, it's rare information and you'll get people message you with either, you know, outlandish, you know, proposals of, Hey, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll support you guys on my Instagram and they have 400 followers. And then you'll have guys who, you know, are really undercut on their stuff as well. And they don't really know their worth or they're bad at social media and they just need help. It, it, there's so much in the middle. And I think it's so valuable to talk about it. You know, there's, there's a bunch of different things that I look at, you know, there's, there's no recipe. There's, there's no like real, Hey, do this and yeah. you'll get sponsored. But I will say from like a racer, if a racer wanted to come to me, a UTV racer, for mm -hmm. example, and they're racing the full SRS series mm -hmm. or pro rock, or they're in the rock bounce world at all. Yeah. And they will email us and say, Hey, I'm racing. I'd like you to sponsor. We're, you know, we're doing this, this, yeah. and this, and this. Well, that's great. And I appreciate that. But the guy that comes to me and he goes, here's my social media page. It has this engagement. My post with made three weeks ago about so and so reached yeah. this many people. Like it's a, more of an analytical thing that, that it's I, business. It's business. It's business. And that's it, it sounds insensitive, but what can you do for the company? Why I see to me that's not insensitive. <laughs> to me, that's like that's like walking up to someone and saying, Hey, can I have your craft for free? And and they're just being like, you know, like like why would you ask for that? And, and I talked to some of these guys and I'm sure you guys get it too. I don't want to say the audacity of people, <laughs> but like the boldness that people have. It's well, just shocking. Yeah. You know, there are people that truly believe that a sticker on the side of their car will sell product. And that may be true in some scenarios. Sure. And there may be that guy out there, but the guy that believes that he pro can provide value to a company by doing things and providing content and you know actually putting in effort like it were yeah it's not, it's not sponsorship isn't free product right you know sponsorship is earned product well and and someone pays for it that's the thing that that kind of gets missed i'll tell you what i'm going to do a little bit i'm actually going to scoot you right this way get okay. you out of the sun a little bit um because I'm, I'm that sun's coming coming around and we'll get you we'll just gonna move the tape a little bit i get you i have the sun here the perks of being the guinea pig here. Right. Let's see if I can get you. You know what I could do is I could just drop that guy down perhaps and instead of it being on the top, it could be on the bottom. Um let's I you can try if you want. <laughs> I got nothing to, I got nothing to lose. All right, we can see. always edit this out. Everybody on YouTube will see this forever. Yeah, feel free. Just notice. There we go. Oh yeah, I see here. Yeah. Well, that's gonna be a time bomb, isn't it? At some point. <laughs> Let's see. I have a I have a third piece. If you want to use that one. Oh, oh. that's probably not gonna survive. I don't think. Let's see if you can. You have one. There we go. All right. Bada bing, bada boom. What are we What are we looking at there? There we go. Much better. All right, cool. Um, back in business. Back in business. And now the RCB. Nice bright spot right yes. here. How about that? <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. Well, anyways, we won't mess with it anymore. Um, you live and you learn all this stuff. Hey. But yeah, man, I mean, I absolutely love working with racers. Yeah. Because I believe they do provide a lot of value for us. I mean, we're learning. I think the best thing is, is we, we kind of grow together. We've worked with the best racers in the industry across almost every platform. And we've learned from that. We've been able to build a better product. And 
I think the, at the end of the day, everybody kind of wins there. Yeah. So it's just all about building those relationships and, and kind of creating that uh, evolution. So, uh, for example, Lauren Healy just talked about your trail series axles, and he is an awesome example of, of the balance of both worlds, has an awesome grasp on social media, and also at the same time, obviously a fruitful racer. Um, I, I always try and point people in the direction of people that do it well. Because, uh, you know, what, regardless of uh, whatever, you know, product he's promoting, I always see it. Facebook, half of this trick is knowing how to work social media, too. Yeah. Because it's got to show up in your timeline. And, like, there's an art to that as well. And I know that you did some research here recently about, you know, uh, the American flag ad versus the white space ad and all the AI that goes in there. <laughs> and it's so, it is, it is. It is the marketing is different, but it's it's almost I don't want to say a disadvantage, but it's so it's so difficult to market yourself correctly on these platforms because of all of the behind the scenes work that it's doing. Well, I mean, there's a reason that there's social media companies sure. that manage your content for you. That's true. Right? It's not just throwing up a post and, and hoping for the best anymore. It's not chronological. It's not anything. I mean, even even for us, our organic reach is is a challenge constantly to get our message out to the our audience that's following us. Yeah, yeah. That's see, that's one thing. that's so interesting, and, and there's so many little caveats to it. Like, uh, you know, I'll post something. Just I'll post something for one of our sponsors, a little blurb and a picture, and that's supposed to be like the remedy, and it'll get like 600 organic <laughs> views. And I'm like, there's no way yeah. that this post that has 40,000 I posted just you know yesterday. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It's, it's the content is so interesting. What people uh, see and like what Facebook or Instagram thinks that they should see and like, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's so weird. We, one of our most successful photos, I'm trying to think way back. Do you remember when that weird, like gravitational thing was where the broom yeah. stood oh, up yeah. by itself? Oh, yeah. So we just stood an axle up by itself. No to, way. Like, to get part of that like, viral, you know, oh. jump on the viral bandwagon. Yeah. Thing. And it did so well. It was just a 300M Dana 60 shaft standing up by itself. And it does better than a... a Didn't it make deep, you mad? It, I mean, it's, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I try to get our message out to people, but it is a challenge. Yeah. But again, like you said, that the, the social media... Lauren Healy, who's, who's a partner of ours, mm -hmm. um, he provides value. He puts in effort. He, yeah. He's out there. He, he knows what he's doing. He's professional. Yep. And, you know, that's what companies are looking for. So, yeah. you know, it took him. He wasn't always that guy. True. Very you know, true. He, very, he, very put true. In, he put in the effort. He made the right choices. And, and now he's doing it. And he's still growing. Yeah. So, you know, if I have any advice to racers trying to figure it out is just to be passionate you know, That's to fact. keep trying to not think that because you're never, no matter how good you are, you're, you're never the best necessarily. That's so, fact. you know, there's always a way to improve. And, and, you know, that's, that rings true in like all facets of life and, and something that, that, uh, I've told everyone, I've had people reach out to me, Hey man, I want to start a podcast directly related to what you do. And I'm like, great. <laughs> Sounds awesome. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you know, I have people reach out to me and they're like, Hey, I would like to do a podcast or I'd like to do this or that. And the trick to all of this is just to keep doing it. Like if you post, if, if I get a new product or a new part of my car, I am going to post a video about it every single time I get a product, because not only will I have done something for that, but that lives forever. I have posts or views on videos that are six months old. Uh, but, but just showing up every day and knowing that people can go to you either for information or, you know, they'll get, you know, all it takes is one person going to your page one time, seeing something interesting, and then they're like, oh, that's the guy that had that. Yeah. Consistency is key. Consistency and passion, man. Yeah. I mean, if they can see that you truly care about what you're doing, mm -hmm. that shows. Absolutely. That rings that I have 14 years ago, I decided to try to come up with a really cool birthday party idea. And because of that, care and effort i'm still doing it and people look forward to it and it's just true genuine passion i'm i'm just excited about it all the time so tell me about the origin of this great event that you guys have started so um yeah i guess that's a whole other chapter isn't it yeah um, we're rolling back a little bit we're going everywhere i like it <laughs> so 
So I created RBD. RBD is a was is my birthday party. Yeah. Um, it sounds very vain to say it like that. So much better than that. Um, <laughs> it's 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 evolved over the years. So for my 18th birthday, going all the way back, let's go back to the Tennessee Media Run days. Yep. And the coal works and the wide open design and being involved in that. Uh, I got to do a shout out to the Rocket City Rock Crawlers because that was another thing that was hugely influential influential on what I was doing because I went to the King of the Hill, I think is what they called it. And it was like the first real popular timed rock climb. Yeah. And uh, I was at that event. I was handing out invitations that I printed out at 17 years old to my off-roading friends to come to my birthday party at Morris Mountain in Heflin, Alabama. I had like 80 50 to 80 people show up yeah that's huge of like the most influential southeast wheelers ever it was so cool yeah like, all the coal works got every nice buggy that was out there was there um i think i was even involved in some like uh racing at that point so xrra i don't know if you've so i missed it but i will listen i'm gonna make a note of <laughs> it we're, we're gonna come back because i have to i wanted to ask you about that so actually. like there were some racers with comp buggies that, yeah. came, that I knew that I invited that showed up. So it was the coolest event. It was way outside my expectations, but what really made it were these guys um, from Kansas that I knew and they were all about pit bikes and good times. <laughs> and I remember that night, the first ever RBD we're running around the campground with an Argo six by six, which is this amphibious vehicle with joysticks for oh controls. Uh, one guy's driving it. One guy's in the passenger seat with a potato gun. Oh gosh. And he's shooting it at guys running around on 50 CC motorcycles. First off, I have to replicate <laughs> this. For, I don't know about the six I by would, six, but yeah. I just want to get hit with a potato yeah, gun. Yeah. Disclaimer. Side. Don't try this. At home. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. Man. But that was the first RBD antics. And yeah. from that, the RBD evolved and we did the next year, I want to say, or maybe it was even that year something like that we hooked a barbie jeep behind a yamaha rhino yeah and drove around the parking lot and it was then we hooked two of them side by side and ran around the parking lot i mean this was like picture a boat with a tube only yeah. add way more possibility for injury yeah and then the next year we started something you may have seen called downhill barbie jeep racing you you originated this i did not originate this Paul Beatty and John Norris did the first official race either at Gray Rock in Alabama or just a random hill uh, in Gardendale, Alabama. So I don't want to take credit. Those guys are the visionaries that created downhill mountain or downhill Barbie Jeep racing. Okay. But I would say one of the first organized ones yeah. was at RBD and it was a horribly dangerous and amazing idea. Yeah. Um, but Man, it just, I think one year we did a, I was working at Blue Torch Fab when they moved to Birmingham mm -hmm. and we decided to do a race. So I got together with some people and we did a timed race up Los Primos. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures the of the video, man. Like 10 feet in the air. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So we, we did that. I think that was like 2009. Dude, that's we crazy. started that. And that was right about, Right about right after that, the SRS stuff really started taking off. So mm -hmm. that was one of the first rock bouncing races, I think, that mm -hmm. anybody really remembers. So, but man, from there it kind of blew up. We had fifteen hundred people at one RBD at, at Morris Mountain, and that place just was just absolutely slam packed. It's mm -hmm. like four hundred and some acres, I think. Yeah, and we unfortunately just outgrew it. So I had to move it. I moved it to Busted Knuckle Off Road for a year. Yeah, and that was going to be our new home. That was in like 2017, yeah. 2016. I remember that long ago. Um, oh, was that park good? Was that park? Good? I loved it, man. Really? What kind of were there? It was very. It was it was loose dirt rocks, mm -hmm. and I mean, I really liked it. It's a shame we, we lost it. Yeah, it's but, right, so I moved from there to Hawk yeah. Pride, and, and Hawk Pride Off Road is now uh, it's home now, and, and we're having it again this November. So yep. every every year for Thanksgiving for the last fourteen years, 
my mom has been disappointed in me for not having Thanksgiving dinner at home. <laughs> what are the actual dates for it? Uh, November 27th through 29th. Okay. So, so that's, on, wait, is the 27th Thanksgiving? The 26th would be Thanksgiving. Okay, so it's day after. Yep. So, yeah, so me. No excuses. <laughs> and, and a thousand of my closest friends are going to go four-wheeling that weekend at Hawk Dude. Pride. Okay, so talk to me about Hawk Pride. Obviously, I've seen the races there and stuff like that. Just giant rocks. What is the park like? Hawk Pride is is got everything um you know for me moving that event i rbd it's it's close to my heart and i don't even want to say what rbd stands for because i love that people don't know yeah they could probably figure it out um i've heard so many things roll back down you know this is a popular one there's a trail mm -hmm. at morris mountain called rbd okay um one of my friends john galbraith named the trail after the ride we were cutting for it and they think it's called roll back down perfect so i love that I'll, yeah i'll always keep it that way but uh, no, uh, Hawk Pride, man, we, we chose it. The, the unique demographic that is the RBD crowd is it's a lot of, lot of hanging out and a little bit of four wheeling. Sure. So it's, it's kind of a reunion of sorts, people that have been doing it. I mean, we've got these guys from Louisiana that come and they've been coming for as long as I can remember. Wow. And Louisiana is not convenient to North no. Alabama at all. And Florida, uh, we got this group from Florida that comes up. And it's just kind of a reunion. So I wanted to make sure that this place could kind of house that vibe, sure. if you will. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it, it does it quite well. It, you know, we've got trails for the UTV guys. you got trails for the rock balancing guy. We've got a bounty hill there. Um, I, I want to say that it's still got a standing bounty on it. Really? Um, Anthony Yunt and maybe somebody else climbed it. But Anthony was the first one up it and, he, and got to name it. I think it's like I think it's no respect. Classic, you know, <laughs> classic Anthony. <laughs> but um, you know, so there's there. It's a lot of rock crawling. Um, yeah. Great for jeeps. Yeah. Um, it's huge, so you can explore. You can go trail riding. How many but, acres is it? Oh, man, I don't even know. To be really? honest with you, um, more than five hundred. Oh yeah. Oh man, I gotta go down there. Oh yeah. I mean, you can ride for a, a full day and not see the same place in a razor. That's crazy. So I always thought it was, I, I always had the vibe that it was small and geared towards rock bouncers. Don't ask me why. I, I absolutely love it. And my Jeep, I love it. My okay. Razor, uh, it's got plenty of rock bouncer stuff too. It's got plenty of hardcore trail rig stuff. Okay. I mean, if you, if you're a rock crawling guy, yeah, it's awesome. Okay. Well, it's awesome. Cool. So, but yeah, man, I just going back to the passion though. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I've been very fortunate to make some great friends in this industry that all share the passion for off-roading, and, and that's what's kept RBD alive all these years is, you know, it's we're going to go see each other on Thanksgiving weekend and go four-wheeling, and it's going to be great. Dude, that's awesome. So, Did you ever think it was going to turn into what it did? Man, you know, I don't even know what it is. Or I, that's, a, that's a good question, too. <laughs> at, at what like point the perception. Did, what point did you – okay, so for someone from the outside, right – uh, to me, it's just, I mean, it's a uh, New Year's Eve at Willing in the Country. So, like, everybody knows New Year's Eve, Willing in the Country. Not so much anymore, but, you know, back, right, in, yeah. back a few years ago, that was like, that's where you go. That's what you do. And, like, RBD, that's one of those staple things in the year. That's where you go. That's what you do. And I, man, I hate that I had to move it. We simply just outgrew it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was so inconvenient for the the space to, to fit that many people there. I think Hawk Pride is a fantastic new location and has been, we've done it there two years now. So this mm -hmm. will be the third year, but I think that's really cool. I, I appreciate it getting online where I see people because Thanksgiving wheel and Thanksgiving weekend is a wheel and weekend. For yeah. People. That's, that, that's what I'm getting you know, at. Where are like, you going Thanksgiving? Exactly. I'm, yeah, I did. My birthday is Thanksgiving. I, I didn't plan this. I can thank my, <laughs> I can thank my parents for this, yeah. for it being convenient. <laughs> You know, my birthday is on the 28th every year. It just so happens to be Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. Um, but it's it's nice to see that, you know, hey, I'm going to RBD or yeah. you should come to RBD. It makes me feel nice that I've been able to create something with the help of some really good friends. And, yeah. And had a nice little event. So tell me about it this year. It's going to be at Hawk Pride, November 27th through the 29th. Uh, you are posting in the Facebook. Is it a group or is it an event? It's, it's an event. Page. Okay, yeah. So on the I should event probably page, do a group page. I don't even have a website for it. It's so old school, dude, low key. It, it works though. It's it works. It's like the event. Yeah. So on the event page, uh, every couple of days you've been putting uh, new prizes or raffles or whatever you guys so are doing. Tell me about it. Every year I've had this hook. You know, we do something different. We used to do the barbecue race. Yep. We used to, we used to do the hill climb at Los Primos. Um, 
I got away from that because there's enough competition in, sure. in the industry. So this is just trail riding. I just want people to go and have fun and lay back. Well, then I got, well, maybe let's do something extra. Yeah. So last year I got an idea to hide some stuff out in the park for prizes, yeah. you know, like a scavenger hunt. Yeah. And you bring me back whatever I hit on the trail. I got with Cardo tracks. He makes maps for the park and he put these, like, these are the highlighted trails. Yeah. It's not easy. You know, this is the, yeah, I'm going to tell you that there's a prize on this trail, but I'm not going to tell you if it's in a tree or under a rock or behind a bush that or, is awesome. or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but this year I, again, very fortunate to have these great relationships with these people and we've been able to come out with prizes. We've got, um, custom spice. I should, I should take a moment. Yeah, to please get my, get my please. list here. Um, because this is, uh, look, when you were putting all the prizes up and everything, I'm like. I was kind of like, damn, dude, people putting up some money, man. Yeah, and that's that's <laughs> it. Yeah, um, I'm I'm super excited about it because we're just we're gonna pass it along. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, I want people to have a good time. So, um, Custom Splice is doing a whole bunch of gift certificate stuff for recovery gear, um, winch rope, um, that sort of thing. Uh, we got Max straps, which is like the ratchet strap down your vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in my opinion, it's the absolute top of the line stuff for that. Mm -hmm. um, JKS Manufacturing, they specialize in, in Jeep, like kind of the luxury side of the Jeep lift kits. Okay. So, it, you know, the good ride, they got the J-Spec stuff. They are like the place to go to for sway bar disconnects. I, that's where I was going to say. Sway bar disconnects. That's what I know. That's like their thing. Um, you know, Busted Knuckle is doing gift certificates um, to the shop. Cool. and or his store i don't know yeah matt myrick let me know cool. what you're yeah, gonna yeah. do but he's in for it um rcb performance of course got some good stuff coming from from us for for that uh hcr suspension is in for like a thousand dollars what um now is this and now is that going to be one you go find on the trail yeah whoo buddy yeah so <laughs> well best top has got some tool tool rolls yeah. that are cool made of the same materials as the soft top uh, adam's drive shaft just got in they make they specialize in jeeps yeah, yeah. But they they make stuff for everything else they're in for like 500 bucks um but nitto tire is in so there's a set of tires up what for wait um, what for full size or utv full si anything you want really Whoa. i guess but for, for right now yeah it's going to be a full-size tire and then i guess you can do whatever you want with wow. it for that so I haven't released what tire it will be yet, yeah. but it's going to be pretty awesome. So I appreciate, huge. appreciate them getting with me on that. Yeah, um, sure. And there might even be uh, Warren. Warren is in with a whole bunch of swag. So I got a bunch of giveaway stuff from Warren Wimp. That's the industry. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, man, it's, it's, it's really good. I've had great support over the years from Busted Knuckle for filming it. I've had great support over the years from Mad Ram 11 filming it and contributing. So yeah. I wouldn't doubt that they'll be there with their swag trailer and stuff. Yeah. If you want to get your, your newest off-road related swag. And, yeah. Um, so I think it'll be really good. I want people to have a full experience and have something worth going for. So Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I'd like to hit $10,000 worth of giveaways. So Do you know where you're at now? I'm in like the five or six thousand range. That's awesome right now. Yeah, that's super encouraging. So, like, it's somewhat. So I'm, I'm gonna do my best to be there. So yeah. So while you're trail yes. riding, download the Carter Tracks map. See yeah. the highlighted trails. Maybe plan your day around those highlighted. They're good trails. They're trails yeah. I literally picked because I enjoy them. Mm -hmm. So they're like trail riding trails. And uh, so, you know, I've got a buddy of mine calling me. I wonder if he's watching it live right now, just to mess with me. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We we'll never um, know. But anyway, man, I, I I think it'll be kind of a nice little extra touch. So yeah. you're out there trail riding, and then hey, look, you just got a thousand dollar gift certificate for HCR suspension. Dude, that's big. So. That's huge. That's that's enough to show up and, and do some, you know, uh, some early morning wheeling, trying to get some of that. Oh, absolutely. Early. Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly how I'm going to release the map yet, but it will be last minute. Okay. So uh, watch the Facebook page if you're not already. You know, it's yeah. clicked interested. I'd highly recommend it if you want in on some of these prizes if you're in cool. the northern Alabama area. So I have th a few more things I want to talk about. And, and, and uh, we got tons of time, nothing to do. What about <laughs> you? Um, so you talked about the uh, Nitto. So the Nitto UTV tires. So um, before I had the world's greatest UTV tire from Super Grip, um, I actually was planning on running the Nittos. I thought they were awesome. I'm a big fan of uh, like a big narrow tire, stuff like that. I thought they were cool. Um, 
fortunately, Super Grip got a hold of me a little bit ahead of time. Um, what do you think of them? Because, I mean, I watched you wheel. They look like they would. Man, you know, I'm I'm kind of a tired guy. Like, yeah, I realize I that I work at an axle company. I love driveline yeah. components, too. But something about tires. Like, I remember being a kid thinking the bogger. Yeah. Like, dude. I just wanted to have boggers. That's, I just, it was the coolest looking tire ever, especially, like, the 35, 15. Like yeah. The super oh, wide. the super wide boys. I, I just thought that was the coolest thing at 13 years old. Yeah. So, you know, I've always been kind of a fan of tires. And um, being in the industry of, you know, going to King of the Hammers and stuff, I've, I favored Nitto a little mm -hmm. bit. I just thought it was a cool looking tire. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my truck, I bought Nitto trail grapplers for my truck. I now have Nitto ridge grapplers on my truck. I got Nitto trail grapplers on my G. Mm -hmm. like, so when the Nitto UTV tire came out, I was like, I got to try it. Yeah. Um, but before that I had, I wanted to try all these different tires. So yeah. when I first got the razor, of course I had the big horns. Then I had the ITP, the black waters, black waters. Okay. How does it? Um, it is a great tire. I think for some kind of wheeling I don't do. Okay. That's my consensus on them as well. I, I think it's, them to work. I think it's a fantastic, probably loose dirt mud yeah. tire, but for me, it, it, it wasn't it. Um, got the gbc mongrel for rocks and road okay. riding i loved it okay i had the patagonia for a while the mile star <laughs> and honestly that tire was the toughest tire i couldn't kill it really because i i like to rock crawl so yeah. i'm always aired down yeah. and i just got to the point of like how low can i go so sure. 32 so i was running at like five psi through wow. the rocks and it, it survived even when i wanted to go fast so that was a tough tire yeah. um so then i got the Got on the bandwagon of the Rockzilla. As we all have at some point. So the Maxxis Rockzilla <laughs> sticky. And I had that for a while. And it, was, it is it is incredible sticky. It really is. Um, and then from there, I got the, the Nitto. And yeah. man, I feel like I've got a pretty good baseline. I mean, I, there's probably tires in there that I didn't mention. Oh, I had the Pro Comp Crawler. That's, that's which a is good like tire. another standard industry tire. Yeah. Um, so the Nitto though, it's, it's the, it's the case back. So it's the same tire that the desert race King of the hammer tires. It's mm -hmm. basically just a mini 40 inch race tire. That's so there's something about their, their case back tire that always has, a that has always, I've always questioned, you know, that thin line of rubber that they keep around there. And it's like, a man, I wish I had a picture. Uh, you see it all on the, on the big cars on the 40 case back. There's like a, a thin line of rubber that they forgot to trim off and it goes from like tread on top, a little bit of side tread, and then it kind of smooths out closer here. And in between those two, it's only when you, you you'll see it like on the race car right before they go to race. Oh yeah, I know. What you know talking what I'm about. talking about? It's like, it's like just, it just needs to be worn off every single time I see it. It drives me insane. Just one of those small details. But like I said, I think these are cool. They... <clears throat> What's impressed me the most, that, so it's, it's it's a sticky. Yeah. They don't advertise it as a sticky. Um, I think just they're new in the UTV world, so they may not know that it's a selling point. To yeah. These guys, I don't know. The buzzword. Um, it, yeah, the buzzword. Yeah. You know, it, it's they're they're a big company, so it, it's it's probably a lot involved on that. So, um, but man, it's it's the best tire I've ever run all around. It's the smoothest at speed. Mm -hmm. It's sticky. It's tough. It's good in dirt. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I probably promote it more than I should just because I surely, and again, I'm, I love off-roading. Yeah. I love tires. So I'm like, yeah. man, this is a cool tire. Yeah. So I, I probably talk about it more than I could, I should, but because I got involved in it so much and, and loved it so much, like there's a 33 allegedly coming out um, at the end of this year. There's a 35 allegedly coming out that's a bigger tire um so but i mean the industry is pushing towards it yeah it's know? true that's that's something that i'm like i'm not on board with big tires i run a 30 it does great and and i think that that comes from uh my rock bouncer i was i had 32s when like it's it's it was all 1000 based and i just couldn't seem to keep those wear parts alive very long granted i was super rough on the car it's what you do in those cars but I just couldn't seem to get it stuff to last now. And I, on my latest full body that I have, I kept the big horns for a long time. If the big horns were a more serious ply. <clears throat> now there's a, there's another tire out there. It's like the big horn eight ply version. Right. And I didn't ever run those. Cause I always heard that they were too like super stiff. Um, if the big horn was like a little thicker, it might be the best performing tire out there. It's awesome. I love them. 
Um, but it, it's one of those where, where, you know, there's something special about a tire. I'm the same way you are. So I don't know what it is. Yours, yours was the Super Swamper. Mine was the Goodyear MTR. Oh, yeah. It was one of those where I just, like, I had them on my Jeep, thought they were great. I had Swampers, and, and they performed like crap for me on my Jeep. They were just junk. But, but they look cool. But sure, they look. But the cool. MTR, I associate that with Walker Evans. Like I really do. Just like his rock crawling days back there. I just remember yeah. the, the forty inch MTR being like the coolest looking tire. I oh, do. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, for uh, sure. My thing, and and I feel like I, I don't, I don't not, I don't like catch a lot of heat. Obviously, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration. But I really prefer the narrow tire, like the. Uh, I know BF Goodrich makes an all-terrain that's a 3510 for trucks. It's their truck spec tire. And I was like this close to buying them. I just thought, I was like, no, 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 no. I'm making a huge mistake. But um, I, I, I've i never been, you know, there's a lot of, there's UTV guys that like want super wide stance. You know, they'll have Turbo S and then they'll put another, you know, they'll have 4.3 and then spacers on top. I'm like, good Lord. Like, when does it stop? And, and uh in fact, Todd Puckett, actually, uh, I believe that's his first name. Um, he drives the Rapture buggy. And I saw it this weekend. And I didn't realize, but he's narrowed his axles. And it, it, that's my favorite buggy just by look. And I'm like, I've never been able to exactly place where it is. And I think it's because it's so narrow. And uh, like I said, there's just something about, you know, everyone has their thing. My thing has always been like big, tall, narrow tire because I watched for the longest time. Uh, you know, the, the Jeep guys who didn't need to run big wide tires. And I also saw the big old 40 MTRs that were super tall and narrow and that like you could navigate them or weasel in anywhere. And I, that's kind of where like, I love that look. And the Nittos fall in that look too. Man, the, the performance of the narrow tire, I, I think for me, in my experience, narrow wheel over, you know, try to get that pivot point over the ball joints yes. and the narrower tire turns easier yeah you know it's steer it's more agile less weight um so i'm i'm with it you know yeah. that's for the wear parts you know like i run a five one wheel mm -hmm. which you know if you're not a utv guy that probably doesn't make any sense to you but it's a very like factory offset yeah. you know very close to getting that pivot point over the ball joint and yeah. getting that scrub radius down so i think that pro prolongs bearing life and performance, you know, increases performance and steering and all that stuff. So I'm with it, man. I, I think that tires, I'm very happy with how I've set up this new razor. Yeah. Um, you know, throw these trail series in there and have a big old time. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to, I have a set of intermediate super grips coming. We'll put them on your car. We'll, we'll do it. We'll do a little swap we'll, around. We'll see do a, how it goes. a sticky off. Yeah, there you go. Uh, cause, cause I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Like, uh, even when you're like, my thing is, even when you're sponsored, like you don't have to pretend other companies don't exist and things like that. And uh, I think it's really good to get perspective. I ran the Rockzillas. I think they were awesome. Probably the yeah. best performing tire out there, but the life in them, just like I ran them three times and they were like gone. And I was just like, dang it. There, yeah, you know? there's, there's pros and cons to everything. There and, is, you know, and sometimes you just get to believe in something and yeah, you know, it's hard to change your mind. So. And, and, and it's so funny. Uh, David Uptain will always forever bust my balls about riding the hype train behind tires. And uh, I, I think it is funny. There is something to it, but uh, all in all, there's a lot of great options out there, but I always think about it in terms of like tiers, you know, you, there's a lot of good B and C and B minus and B plus tires. But like when you really try them all, you get those A plus tires any of them will do the trick and it's just a matter of, you know, what's your flavor. Mine with the super grip, I, I have like two, three pounds and forgotten to air them up and all kinds of other stuff and had situations where I should have destroyed those tires and they're still hanging on for me. That's kind of my thing where I'm like, it's another one of those. If I ever get stranded, that tire is going to help me make it back. It will limp itself back. I, yeah. I ran it flat for a long time. Should have had holes all up in it, aired it up and it worked fine. For me, that's one of those like less worry points. I, I don't know. Maybe it's like my immaturity in the off-road world, but like uh, I have I have this ever-longing fear of not breaking parts, but like breaking so bad I can't get back to the trailer. You know, I, <clears throat> I don't I don't know that I share the that necessarily. I just don't want to ruin a trip. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to ruin the good time. Yeah, and you know, 
quality parts, man, that, that matters. Don't, yeah. don't go out there without maintaining your rig. Don't go out there with stuff that you know that's going to fail and, and you can enjoy yourself. And, you know, a flat tire or a, you know, broken axle, shameless yeah. plug. Yeah. You know, you travel to an off-road park for the weekend, you break on Friday morning of your three-day weekend, yeah. then what do you do? You know, exactly. now you're searching for parts or working on stuff when you could be having a good time. And That's true. Spend a little bit more money and a little bit more time. And you're holding your friends back. Nothing yeah. worse. Nothing's worse than your friends waiting on you to go wheeling. Yeah. Unless, especially if they're your good friends. That's because it. they make you feel way Horrible. worse. Horrible. <laughs> they give you so much crap about yeah. it and talk trash the whole time. Yeah. But they're helping you. Yeah, but they are. You'd rather them just not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so one thing I always want to talk about too, and you just mentioned it, is like uh, readiness on the trail. So uh, I have I have guys who are close to me, and they, and they're like, hey man, when can I come ride with you on these big rides? Like, you know, when when you go wind rock eight hours one direction, I want to come on one of those rides. I'm like, when's the last time you looked at your like camber? You know, your tires are folded in. And, you know, I have to fix all the axles you break on the trail. Why would I bring you with me? If you can't, if you can't carry yourself, uh, do, do you, at what point does that change or does it ever change? I mean, I know it's just basically being an adult, like expecting people to carry their own weight. You know, I, I think it comes from the unique demographic that is the UTV guy mm -hmm. too, because, you know, the, the, don't get me wrong. There's totally that guy in every aspect of every hobby you mm -hmm. know the guy that just wings it and hopes yeah. for the best but um and honestly that guy probably has more fun than most of us and unfortunately <laughs> it's true <laughs> but you know i i think prep and proper maintenance and something really matter and that, that stuff really matters to yeah. to your trips if you're doing like a if you're riding in the local spot behind your house or something like that i get it you know just go ride and send and, and wing it yeah but if you're planning a big trip like for example we went to uh Silver Lake sand dunes. Mm -hmm. I've never really spent any time in the sand dunes. So I was like, okay, the sand dunes, it's rough. Like you're jumping, you're landing, you're going fast, you're hitting the whoops, like every pivot point, everything will be stressed out. So I replaced, um, I run an HCR suspension and I ordered the bushing kit, you know, it's basically new stuff, but I was like, I didn't want to take any chances. Yeah. So all new bushing, all new pivot points, you know, new wheel bearings, new everything, like just unnecessary prep, but that's just my personality. But did you have any issues when you were there? Mm -mm. There it is. Not, not a single that's, one. That's the, that's the gist of it all. And that leads me, because I was, I was getting there, you know, I'm just moseying my way around all these topics here. Uh, the dunes. I've never been. I've been to, like, Panama City at Winrock. Nowhere near the same. Tell me about the dunes. There's a Panama City at Winrock? Yeah, on top of the mountain. The sand the sand on top of the mountain. Huh. you never never been there. I guess I missed it. Wid Widowmaker. Dragon's back. Oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I know what you're talking okay. about. Yeah, it's 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 like it's probably sand like that deep, but it's sand. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Okay. Um, I, it was a great experience. You know, um, I would say that to get the absolute fullest experience, you'll want a paddle tire in the back. Is it? it are you really at that strong of a disadvantage without one? Not at all. No, okay. I mean I aired down again. Shameless Nitto plug. Sure. I aired down to like six PSI and had a big time. I mean, we had no problems. I went up there with another buddy of mine who's got Nittos and we did everything that we wanted to do. The only thing that I didn't want to do, and I, I talked to a, a, a guy about it on the way, and I was like, I want to do a wheelie. Like you see all these sand dune wheelies where yeah. they load it up and the horsepower pushes the wheelie through. And I was talking to a guy on the phone and I was like, "That's I'm going to do this. And he was like, do you have paddles? I was like, no. He's like, you're not going to. And he was right. There's, there's no, that, that hook isn't there without paddles. So I would say, you know, if you're going to like Glamis or, or uh, maybe even like Little Sahara, like a big sand dune weekend, mm -hmm. I'd get some paddles. Silver Lake, you can have a great time on, on regular tires. Is, is Silver Lake its own area or is that attached to the Badlands that you guys were at? It's its own area. So Silver Lake is in kind of the, it's on the, I don't want to say coast because it's a lake. But it's on the the west coast of Michigan in kind of the central Michigan. It's really cool, and it is right there on the one. You've got Silver Lake, which is a, a smaller lake, and then on the other side of that is the Great Lake. Mm -hmm. So it's very scenic, very cool, but it's small. Yeah, I mean, relatively speaking, we somehow spent all day and an entire tank of fuel in our razors there, 
had a blast. I would go back again for ne- another day. You would go there. Yeah. Okay. I had a blast. But you're doing the same thing over and over again. Just going up the hill. But it's so fun. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of dune rollers and it's a big hill and you crest them and jump the top. And it's for me for the first time, I couldn't get enough of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would, I would definitely go back. I want more dune time for sure. These UTVs, man, you, you look at them, you know, talking about the West coast, you look at them, they're, made, they're just made for it. Yeah. It's their little sand cars that you can finance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, isn't that dangerous. <laughs> so, yeah. so they're great. Yeah. I mean, I, I went, when I was preparing for the dunes, my, my girlfriend's actually from Michigan. So that kind of motivated me to go on this trip. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I looked at like Cletus McFarland did a YouTube video up there and he's, he, he, he is, man, how to explain it. Uh, he's in, he's got a tube chassis, essentially Corvette. That's probably the most claim to fame that I, he does a lot of YouTube stuff. Um, he's buddies with the side by side blog guys, and now he's doing okay. new TV content with those guys. Um, he actually runs RCV axles okay. in his can am, but, uh, I watched his video of it and he's from Florida. So mm-hmm. he's like a mud guy. So they're like doing the skimming across the lakes there. Yeah. I'm like, man, that just everything about it looks so fun. I gotta go try it. So after watching some videos and whatnot, we just pulled the trigger. I've got some friends up at sport truck USA, which is like Fox and uh, BDS and JKS and they're going that weekend. So it just it all lined up. That's cool. Okay. So you go to the dunes then you hit Badlands, right? Yeah. Okay. Badlands, obviously super famous park. Uh, tell me about it. So I went to Badlands like 15 years ago or more for an XRA race. Okay. And that's the only time I ever experienced it. I think it was XRA. It may have been something else. I don't know. It, it I, I went with yeah, it blurs together. But anyway, it's fine. <laughs> I digress. Um, so I went there years ago, but I never saw the place. We went to the race area. We did the race thing. We left. So uh, it was it was one of those places I'll never go just there. Like it's so far away, I'll never make a trip just to go there. But I, I wanted to hit it on the way back because it's in the it's in Indiana somewhere, um, northern Indiana. But it's like gravel everywhere. So it's not necessarily sand dunes. It's like gravel dunes. Hmm. It's pretty wild. That's weird. Um, so it's a unique territory, unique terrain that I wanted to experience. So we had a, we had a big time there too. Full yeah. Day. That's a very well done park. I mean, it's their check-in facility is amazing. Yeah. They've got all the product you need. If you break something, they've got like a full, it's like going into a UTV oh, yeah. ship. I'm pretty sure they have a yeah, UTV I, ship there. I was about to say they had an actual machine. I'm recalling your story. Now. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So it was a great trip of doing something I'm definitely not used to doing. I was way out of my comfort zone. Cool. Um, which I think is good yeah. to do, you know, yeah. you get out of your comfort zone, you learn something new and, and expand. So, um, but we actually, that was the first trip on these. Um, I ran them just kind of as a, as a final, like breath out. Yeah. yeah we're going to yeah, tell yeah. these are, this is the first production one. So let's test it and make sure we didn't miss any dotted eyes or any yeah. T crosses and that we're good to go. So cool, man. Um, it was a good trip. So you've been wheeling all over the country because let me say this, I don't forget. We're going to talk about XRA and <laughs> we're going to get there. I promise you've been wheeling all over the country, uh, in Jeeps and razors and everything. Give me your top three places to go wheel in a Jeep, start in a, there. in a Jeep, in a Jeep. We'll start there. All right. Uh, I'd say number three would be Winrock. Okay. I'm, I'm, I like that. Uh, number two, hmm, in a Jeep. I have not wheeled personally there, but it's on my to-do list, so I want to say that it's number two. Okay. Would be the Rubicon Trail. Okay, yeah. Because it's just, it's legendary. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, It's the Jeep thing to do. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I know that's cheating because I haven't actually done it myself, mm, but, you know, yeah. but number one is definitely Moab. Okay, that Hands was down. that was my that was where I thought that was going. Um, I would like to go to the Rubicon. I talked to Phil Blurton last time he was on the show. He he takes his Can Am trail rig down there all the time. Um, it looks like they're constantly like dumbing it down. You know, they're like uh, the big sluice turned into the little sluice, and they're the commies. I don't know what to call them. The <laughs> park rangers. <laughs> they're they're making it less impactful on the environment or whatever. Uh, 
<clears throat> I, I feel like I need to get out there sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'm actually missing out on a trip this fall. Uh, I might even be going on right now. I don't know, but to do the Rubicon, and I just I couldn't make it happen. You know, I just see. couldn't align it. Um, that's but that's something I want to experience that for sure. But Moab, man, if I had to wheel one place, like I would buy a Jeep, leave it in Moab, and fly there all the time. Like it's, it's not a bad <laughs> idea at all. It's it's that good. It's it's so. It's great in a Jeep. It's also great in a UTV. Don't get me wrong. I love it in a UTV too. It's a different experience in a UTV because you cover ground and it kind of takes the sense of adventure out in a UTV because it's, it's, UTV is just so capable sure. and stable and whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you can jump out of stuff that you would have to, you know, tediously crawl in a, in a Jeep. That makes sense. But, well, that goes back to my Jeep days that, you know, Moab, you just named them all. Moab, Rubicon, and Ford Ice were like the three that I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do it in my Jeep. I got a buddy that uh, rides, does the Fordist Trail a lot. And I have just that, the camping it's thing, beautiful. the fording, the, yeah. the river, all that. I want, I'd like to experience it. The whole, because isn't that, well, the Rubicon's a big bear. It's right? nearby. Yeah. It's, it's just nearby. gorgeous territory. Yeah. Okay. Top three for UTV. Putting the pressure on. Folks. Yeah, <laughs> it's so different. I think Moab will be in there somewhere. I'm just trying to rank it. Uh, I'd say the Hammers third. Ooh. Um, Let me just pause because we hadn't talked about that. Why? Diversity. Explain. Like in a UTV, you can do so much and you can cover ground. So if it were just covering ground, it would be boring to me. Mm -hmm. I would also like to do some rock crawling, but I don't want to just only do hardcore rock crawling where I'm just beating the crap out of my stuff constantly. Yeah. So, you know, at, at, at the hammers, you got the little dune area, you got the desert, the open desert where you yeah. just haul ass, you got the hardcore rock trails, you got just trails that you can just go, you know, exploring. Sure. Um, the whole desert life thing is really strong out there. Like the, the food, like everything about a hammer's trip is pretty cool. So it's like an immersive experience. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. It's a full experience. It's, now, would you recommend going during hammers or not going? I would go the weekend before or after and during. Okay. I would miss that hammers week. Okay. But yeah, you need to get some trail time because once the trail, I'd probably go after, well, no, after the trails would be beat up. So yeah, go yeah, before and do some four wheeling. Okay. I think that, so that, that would be, what is it? I say three for that. Yeah. Um, I gotta say Windrock again for just, two. or just normal, like, yeah. Yeah. Windrock's number two. Mob's number one. Okay. I, I tried to make it. Different, okay. No, I get so, it. I get it. So I just traded, but the hammers and Jeep wouldn't be fun to me. It seems like it would be really hard on stuff, and you'd have to walk away with some severe body damage. But and let me also preface this trail riding: I have not wheeled in Colorado, and Colorado is a total bucket list. You beat me so, to the next question, then. <laughs> I, mean, I, I would say that the Ure area, and like I want to experience the Black Bear Pass. Black Bear Pass. Yeah, I it? told my wife I was like, we need to do Black Bear Pass after hit my lab. So yeah, I haven't done any of that. So would highly recommend it for those that are looking into it everything that i've seen about it looks amazing i just haven't experienced it myself so i can't put it on the list even though i cheated and put rubicon on my list yeah um but it is yeah um being able to do this like rcv has given me so many opportunities to travel and meet yeah. people and go to places and do events and stuff and i really appreciate that because i genuinely enjoy it um you know i, I might enjoy it too much and push too hard sometimes. There was a year when I first started that I was just going to everything. Yeah. And every weekend I was loaded up and traveling somewhere for hours across right, the country. Man. And uh, I've, I've figured out how to balance yeah. it now. Um, but no matter what, Easter Jeep Safari is like the coolest event. King of the Hammers. Really? King of the Hammers is you have to do at least once. Uh, Easter Jeep Safari, you have to do. If you're at all a Jeep person, even if you're not a Jeep person, it's just, it's a town taken over by the four-wheeling community yeah and everything's four-wheeling and it's just so cool um the trails are cool but it's the experience yeah you know can you take your utv out there you're gonna be like frowned upon no not necessarily <laughs> i mean you can totally do that during ejs week okay for sure there's people that do it we okay. see them out there 
um, you know, because you appreciate the Jeep world, you'll realize yeah. that you're going to sit in this trail, yeah, and you're going to be in traffic, yeah. That's part of it. It's part oh, of the experience. Yeah. Um, but that, and you know, there's honestly there's not a lot of East Coast stuff I've been really doing. Mm -hmm. It's it's been a lot of West Coast, even though I live in Tennessee. It's I get it. Uh, it it's it's got to be. It's not it's not the fact that it's just nice to get away from what you normally are doing, but also I mean you mentioned the market like the market is there too and um, it is a, in my opinion you know I've been thinking here lately like would I like to get some kind of trail car you know would I like to get some kind of four cylinder Sammy buggy and go take it to AOP and have a good weekend and that seems less appealing because I just know it ends in a rock, it ends in like a rock bouncer ish trail car, you know? Yeah. There's not enough that's, power. There's not enough tire there. That's kind of the path that I took when I got the Jeep is I had the UTV mm -hmm. and it did everything that I wanted to do on the trail, but what it didn't do, it didn't drive the trail and it wasn't comfortable necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, it rode good. Don't get me wrong, but there's yeah. no heat and air, right? You know, there's no storage. Mm -hmm. I couldn't bring a big cooler for the weekend, you know. Can't so bring your guy. friends is my thing. I need to force leader. So, <laughs> so I, we build the Jeep and we go on these adventures because I'll, I'll be honest, the the best, the highlight experience of my four-wheeling career was Ultimate Adventure. That's okay. the coolest thing I've ever done. It's just because as a kid, it's probably because as a kid I read in a magazine, I built it up, but it was worth it. It was yeah. an amazing experience. Um, the guys that do it, the cronies, um, Rick Payway that planned it, like he's just, he's awesome. Trent McGee, who's been on every single Ultimate Adventure yeah. for the, uh, of all time, is a genius when it comes to routes and stuff like that. But the, you know, because Ultimate Adventure is a secret. So yeah. you sign up for this week of wheeling and you don't know where you're going at all. That's so cool. You don't know, I mean, you don't know where you'll end up. Sometimes they give you a hint by like, you're going to park your truck here and mm -hmm. we're going to start here. So you're like, okay, well, we're going to go over this property. Maybe. Yeah. But, you know, with people like Rick Payway, you're going to go over that property before you're going to go up down and south and over and across. And you're going to yeah. get on a ferry somewhere. You didn't even know ferries existed. Anymore, right. But they're there right. and you're going to go across one. Like, it's just a great experience. Yeah. Ultimate Adventure is the coolest thing. So if like having a, an adventure vehicle, something that can hit the highway and hit the trail, I think that's a cool aspect of the industry. Yeah. You know, it's very tough to do that. You yeah. Know, keep maintenance and work on your stuff and have high quality parts but it is it is uh i want to bring something up uh his uh, rick rick payway his jeep that was two front sides of a jeep do you remember that from the magazines yep so they built that i think fred williams might own that jeep now it's amazing um but yeah that's I, was that when the jk came out it was uh yeah because it was a 2013 and the jk's came out in 12 11 uh, 11 uh seven Seven. Oh, seven. Uh, okay. Well, then it, what it was is it was... But it was probably just a way to make a JK different because yeah. JKs are the cookie cutter off-roader. They you know, are. I say that because I have one. And it's yeah. Yeah, uh, They all look the same. Yeah. So, what, I, what I'm thinking of is the year that they released all the neon colors was 2012. Uh, and Because he had... I bought the same color GTP he had. And uh, to me, I remember seeing that. And what it was for people who are just listening, it was, you know, if you took it from the back of the driver's side door forward regular two-door jk but the back half was a truck bed or was it a hood it was the other was front the yeah so, okay, front okay. Grill and fender okay. all that yeah so it, it it essentially was from the 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 driver's side door back it was the hood tire fender and grill of the front of the jeep so it was like uh it was literally a mirrored car from there it was really unique and and that's the point of Ultimate Adventure too, is yeah. to be unique. They've always promoted the unique builds and they've always done unique builds. You know, they did that that super duty on portals. Um, Dude, before anybody else was even dreaming of wheeling that hard on portals. Yeah, to drive the highway speeds on portals is pretty pretty crazy. But they've always done that. They the, the readers, like if you want to go on it, you know, if your lifelong dream is to go on Ultimate Adventure build a weird rig yeah i mean yeah they had a bunch of scouts on it this year i think which is something you just never see any international scouts anymore was this year the one where they did the boats they had to put a kayak on it that was 2015 or 2017 i went on that year okay actually. okay um and it rained the whole time it was yes. pretty ironic that we had boats yes. because it rained the whole time yes. i remember um, that there was a male jeep if yeah. I remember correctly, there's yeah. like, like a postal Jeep. Synergy suspensions yeah. or poly performance. They built a right hand yeah. drive. 
uh, post G and made it like it was awesome. It was, and they, they had the, the canoe on top. Well, we all had canoes on yeah. top, and you know, we only got those canoes down to have like a battle boat scenario one day. Really? Because it was pouring rain. The only time it stopped raining, <laughs> we like threw these canoes. So we carried these canoes this whole yeah. adventure for one like lake. We got in the lake and played battle boats essentially. Nice. Nice. But yeah, no, that's uh, highlight something about that. I'm so glad they're still doing that, you yeah. know, because the magazine world has just changed so much. But yeah. I, I think officially now it's the four wheeler ultimate adventure, yes. um, which is. You know, I, I missed an opportunity to go on it this year as a, as a co-driver mm -hmm. with, with Ian Johnson. I should have gone. And uh, Ian, if you're listening, I'm kicking myself right now just talking about <laughs> this. But um, yeah, it's, I guess my passion for off-roading and, and, and trips like that has carried over these years. And to be still interested in a hobby, golly, 20 years later. Yeah you know, I think is, is pretty unique. Not a lot of people stick to it like that, it but is. being able to do these, these very fortunate experiences, I've been, I've been very lucky. I, yeah. I feel blessed to be able to go and enjoy yeah. all these yeah. different aspects of, of the industry. Of so, course. well, that's something that's unique about off-roading. It seems like once you get into it, it's always there in some facet. I know for a while, like I got really big into the uh, working out, I do jujitsu, things like that. Like, like these other, I always think about it in terms of like a computer, like you have processes running on a computer and one process that is always running, whether or not it's in the foreground or, you know, it's one of the apps that are in the background running, uh, off-roading is always there and it will, it just never goes away. I think what's interesting about it is, is the ability to take different people, throw them in a, of scenario yeah. and have them have this common ground yeah because you get to talk to people you get to learn things you get to build yourself and grow you know i've i've remember sitting on the trail talking about stocks yeah you know just with different people that i wouldn't have met otherwise yeah i think it's it's very cool and this then at the same aspect you know you got the social media side of off-roading mm -hmm. where you're getting converse across the country casually to people doing the same thing but totally different yeah and you learn you experience new things and yeah. Um, and build friendships off of that. Or that guy that you met that one time and now you're Facebook friends with him and you you look at his family photos. And yeah, that's the weird daughter stuff. Grow up, you yeah, know? no, it's, <laughs> it's so funny you say that because uh, I've had to like get more selective with who I like friend on Facebook on my personal account. It's because like someone will just see like, the, oh, hey, that's the guy that runs a podcast where I, and, you know, seven years later, I, I know everything about he's done and I asked him about his Cancun trip in 2012. <laughs> And I'm like, what have I done? And, and I, why do I? <laughs> I? I struggle with that, but I also love love people. So yeah. I, 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 I'll talk to anybody <laughs> about anything for any any length of time. But Do you ever run into crazy people in, in, in your off-roading world? And let me let me give you a little more, more meat to that question. Uh, this weekend, I was at Blue Holler. And this guy, and this is what I love about off-roading. We, we were in a little bit of traffic coming out of the race, like getting back to the parking lot. And uh this guy's, you know, he's asking about tires and all kinds of different things. And he just starts riding with me and this other guy from Danger Zone Off-Road, uh, Kyle. And he's like trailing behind us. And this dude is going crazy in his razor behind me. I'm talking like, you know, when you're in two-wheel drive, you can play a little bit more. You can, you know, smoke tires on a ledge. And he's doing that behind me. But he gets in front of me and he's like, he hits a guy in a razor. I'm, I'm kidding. It's muddy. We're sliding everywhere. He hits one guy's razor, hits a tree slams on the brakes and runs into another tree. And I just think to myself, I'm like, I love being out here because I would never have run into this guy <laughs> in a million years. But instead, this guy is going to end up, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this guy made my day by watching him just plow his machine into a tree, turn around, give me two thumbs up. And he's just like, ha, ha, ha. and I'm just like, what is wrong? <laughs> You're like, what's going on, man? Well, that's, yeah, that's just it. You just, you, you get to meet different people. I that love it. The same thing. It's, yes. it's such a diverse industry in that aspect that anybody can get into it. It is. It's, and there's, it's so funny too, because, uh, you know, there's always the cliche of like, don't judge people by, you know, by their, don't judge a book by its cover rather. Um, and I'll meet people and I'll take a step back sometimes. And I'm like, there is no situation where he, you know, this guy in my path, they cross ever in outside of this situation. And if I didn't have this situation, you know, if I didn't, you know, if you didn't walk up and ask, Hey man, do you have any, like, can I have a piece of beef jerky on the side of the trail? Just randomly, you know, 
I we probably would have never crossed, but those are the friendships that I have now. Those are the people that text me to go ride and hey man, uh, you want to go ride AOP this weekend? And I'm like, sometimes I, I get those texts. I'm just like, what a weird contrived situation we've ended up in here where this is like my favorite guy to go riding with. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. The friendships that I've made through off-roading that have been lifelong, the people that may or not even off-road anymore. Yeah. You know, but I'm still friends with them or maybe they've come and gone, they've sold rigs, they've gotten in and out of it and stuff like that. I, I man, I could not think of of a, of a different way to to meet people that I don't know how to how to say that, but yeah. It's it's just been so nice to casually meet these people. Yeah and bond and grow and learn things like i guess you know yeah. i know that we've kind of touched on that before but it's it's just that common ground yeah i guess of it makes you comfortable with people yeah like even at a gas station you know you stop and you talk to somebody that you wouldn't otherwise talk to but you're like hey man i got that same tire yeah. hey man you know i've been thinking of what do you think about those shocks or that's exactly my point. And, and I think that the reason I think that it's been like on my mind more is, and, and not like political or anything here, but we're just seeing such crazy division right now that I, I was thinking about something like my brother called me and he was talking to me the other day about, you know, Biden and Trump and this and that. And, and, and I'm just like, you know, he was talking about who he's voting for and all this. And I was like, there's so much division right now. And, and why is it that I can just go in the woods and like, I'm in a group of 200 people, any single one of them, I feel like I could ask any question. And it's not, you know, a situation where there's not that, that uh, weirdness to talk to people that's so prevalent these days. And, and, and I've really been, especially like really just this past week, I've been trying to put my thumb on it. Like what makes it, when I go out there and we're all just hanging out, like what guard comes down when you talk to these people or, or what are, what are you doing to represent yourself differently? Like what vibe am I giving off different where I can just like go see people I've never met in real life off the podcast and we'll just strike up a conversation. And it's just like, how is this happening? But in, you know, the other 90% of the world, like people are just not this way. We've lost that like social art. Yeah, I don't know that people aren't that way, you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like this is just a medium that we can get across, I, don't know, I guess that's not the right words, but um, something that makes it easy, it's an icebreaker. Yeah, sure. You know, it's sure. a really casual icebreaker, you don't even know that it's an icebreaker, you yeah. know, you're just already in the same situation, Yeah. and it's just easier to talk to people, but, and I think too, a little bit of this hobby is a certain type of person, not, sure. not like, not talking like politically, but like personality wise sure. of like, they're more adventurous. Mm -hmm. Um, they're more dedicated. If you don't have dedication, you, you can't do this. You. Yeah. I, agree. I mean, it's a lot of work to load up, to work on stuff, to go tear it up, to take it home, to wash it, to unload yeah. it, to work on it some more. It's true. So, you know, you've got these really dedicated and motivated people and then on their own, just kind of, yeah, they're all special people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, special people. It's pretty cool. And, and, and I'm not saying it's just off-roading. Yeah. I think it's any sort of hobby that you have to put an effort into. Yeah. I think it creates a lot of unity yeah. in, in the culture. Yeah. So. Anyways, to get it, to get off my, my, my thoughts there, I really have been thinking a lot about that this week because I had a great time. It's just one of those things <laughs> that's just on my mind. Anyways. Let's talk about XRRA oh, okay. <laughs> to finally bring the conversation all the way back at, at two right. hours. So back to back to racing. Yes. Um, I got involved in XRA right at the beginning. I was very lucky. Uh, this is the um, photography side of things. Mm -hmm. So like my Ricky B photography website, uh, I was doing that. I was also working for Crawl Magazine. So I was going to these events and these races and they were awesome. XRA is like short course rock bouncing. Explain because short course rock bouncing is a thing now. It's yeah, <laughs> but it was just cool, man. I don't know. Imagine, I think it was possibly the vehicles that were involved too, because okay. it was more realistic buggies. Okay. Um, it was before the insane horsepower. It was before the unbreakable axles. It was like a tube rock crawler that you forced to go fast. Sure. And it was straight up hill climbs for like 10 foot. And then you ran to a jump and you jumped a gap jump. And then you made a turn through a mud hole and you side hill and you dropped off the next ledge. And 
they ran them two at a time on separate courses, but they were together. If that sure. makes sense. Yeah, so yeah, it was yeah. timed separately, but they were running and it looked like it was just very exciting to watch. It was a great layout. Um, I don't know why it didn't survive the test of time, but many of those racers that were in XRA are now in ultra four. That's where I, so that was what I was going to ask is it, that seems like a central America. Like I did a little bit of digging. It was, it was, I mean, pretty big for a while there. And, and why did it all go West coast guys? I think just the support of the industry, Okay, you know, there's a post online about why the sponsorship of the East Coast Race Series don't see the sponsorship of the West Coast Race Series. Yes. And that's a great question. Why is that? I don't have an answer to that. My my thoughts, I have opinions. I have some opinions as well. Um, We're going to talk about that. But <laughs> it comes down to perception. Yeah. And as well as just there's more people that are dedicated there mm-hmm. in the West Coast. You know, you've got your, your more dedicated race teams. We've got like Tim, uh, Tim Cameron. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of a dedicated racer, but that's, I would say you have, you have a a very small handful compared to the West coast. I would agree with that. Um, so anyway, it kind of progressed to the West, you know, you had the Moab, uh, BFE XRA race, Mm -hmm. you had Colorado XRA Mm -hmm. race. But a lot of it was East Coast too. A middle, there was Missouri, yeah. there was Indiana, there was Jellico, Tennessee, which Classic. was a very cool old rock spot, rock on spot. Um, Still active for the We Rock guys. It is, yeah. I saw that recently. Yeah. Um, I got on the phone with Cody Wagner from Laser Nut, and he was telling me about it. He said it was awesome and this and that and great, and I should have been there. And I was like, I should have been there Dude, too. I, I have no reason why I shouldn't have been. I didn't know about it, but it, I think it all comes down to the perception and the marketing. Sure. I think that, you know, so the rock bouncing world has kind of a monster jam style of marketing. I think that's good. And, you know, you see the ultra four style has a more mainstream type marketing. Explain the difference between the two when you say that. Um, I look at SRS, pro rock, outlaw, maybe any of that I'm missing. Mm-hmm as a entertainment Mm -hmm. like i don't necessarily follow who's winning and losing as much as i am just purely entertained by the show by the spectacle like it's cool to watch it's really cool to see i enjoy seeing the racing Mm -hmm. of course down deep i'm pulling for you know certain things i see things that i like or guys that i know or whatever everybody's that way yeah but it's a it's cool Mm -hmm. it's just a whole entertainment package whereas you know, you really don't watch Ultra Four to be entertained. Really, I mean, it's 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 hard to watch. Yeah, but it's a point series, and it's standings, and it's a results, and it's a you know coverage of who's in first. It's not necessarily they're not at the 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 wreck area. They're you know following the the leader of the pack, and mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. It's more of a it's more of a watching the race mm-hmm. and getting involved in who's winning and who's losing than watching the action i think yeah that makes sense that's my perception i don't know if that's you know the way that it is but um but for sponsors like when you send a like a packet or whatever of of, you know metrics and this and that i can't explain to you why one's doing better than the other sure you know because as far as like viewership that's it that's the that's the anomaly right is the viewership of east coast stuff and if I, if I had to give my two cents, uh, just at the races that I've been at, which haven't been very many in the past couple of years, to be honest, um, organization just seems iffy. Like it just needs to be a little bit more organized in terms of, you know, who's up to run, where are the racers, are the racers in line ready to run speed of, you know, okay, he's up, you know, he's out on to the next, you know, it just seems to lack a little bit of organization. Um, and, and, and again, this, this will, this is take what it is. It is what it is. Um, the way that it's represented on live streams and things like that, uh, whether, whether it be host or quality of live stream, things like that. Like if the East coast market is going to bank on spectacle, the spectacle needs to be viewable. I, I can see that. I, I think, 
when you're talking like look look at the king of the hammers live feed for example Beautiful. you've got you've got hosts that have been provided information mm -hmm. i think that's super cool yeah. you know you that's get a background big, that's a get, big deal which um you get to know what's going on in the race mm -hmm. details you know kind of mm -hmm. still king of the hammers is kind of a little bit of a mystery when it's going on who's winning who's in the lead whatever yeah, that's the fun part my and it kind of is yeah. you know what's happening out there yeah um I, th I think that's a part of probably of the sponsorship is you, you've got a professional um, media crew out there. Media crew, you know, it, it takes money to make money, right? It does. So they're, they're spending a lot of money to give, give a production value out there. And not to say that the East Coast isn't. Mm -hmm. It's just a little different. It is. Know? The East Coast it still is. has that grassroots feel. And I think that appeals to people a little bit too because it's accessible. Mm -hmm. You know, as a racer, you can get into it. As a racer, it's very intimidating to get into Ultra 4. It's the reason I didn't race Ultra 4. The reason I didn't keep the car that was Ultra 4 ready to race and race it. I didn't feel like my 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 resources are not equipped for Ultra 4. So I, I think everybody kind of fits that niche a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that the East Coast should be necessarily doing anything better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't necessarily think that they're not as good. Mm -hmm. I just think it's different. It is. And, and I, I like what you said because... I, I'm sometimes critical of things and it, like the host, for example, um, the host being provided details, you have to set and, and I'm, gonna, I'm picking on the host, but that goes to safety crews that goes to recovery crews. You have to be set up for success by the organization. It's and it's a lot. And, it is. And you, you know, ultra four crew, they are, they're top notch guys. They are. I mean, they, they really. They put in the effort. They they are passionate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a lot of people involved too. That's another thing. It's a lot of people involved, and it kind of it again. It just it takes a lot of effort to do an event like that. I get that. Um, even if it's just a local Ultra yeah. Four race, you know, yeah. when they came to Tennessee, Tennessee, you know, it's a much smaller production than the mm -hmm. King of the Hammers race, but it's still a lot of work and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but the end result was still very. I mean, in my opinion, very high quality. I, I, I mean, I was, I watched the ultra four race over the race that was happening that weekend, you know, it was kind of one of those where like, it may be just my interests or what have you, but I watched that race and it was less to actually watch and more to actually keep up with who's in the race, who's doing this and that. And, da, da. Yeah. And I think that's a struggle too, is people want to be entertained. Like, yeah, it is. My girlfriend will 100% rather go to a rock bouncing race mm -hmm. than an ultra four race. Mm -hmm. She, you know, you can sit there on the hill, you can casually be comfortable, you can watch it happen right there. And yeah. so what if there's a 20 minute recovery? Sure. You know, she doesn't have to move. It's, yeah, that's you know, true. Stuff that's happening there. So, I mean, it's just, it's a different, different world. But the sponsor thing coming back, like the, you know, obviously there's sponsors. We sponsor, we're involved mm -hmm. in Southern Rock Racing. We've been involved in Pro Rock. You know, we're involved mm -hmm. in Ultra Four, but we're a small company. You know? You're not Ford. You're not, not you're not progressive insurance. Right. And to see that, that just, that's just business. It I is. think, it is. you know, and, and who knows what, what ultra four or SRS or any of them have in the future, you know, do you have any ideas or projections? Where do you think this ends or where do you think this goes? Oh uh, man, I, I get the vibe of like the, like the rock bouncing thing splitting off into being a racing thing there's going to be some sort of racing rock bouncing and then there's going to be some sort of like felled entertainment rock bouncing with like a monster jam okay you know yeah i feel like they had that going for a while with those those core drivers yeah and that had those core drivers had a following yeah but it's grown now mm -hmm. so it's almost like you have to have a different league mm -hmm. if you will i don't know my speculation mm -hmm. it's grown so much it has i actually kind of like that like you know, when you think of Monster Jam, the first thing that goes in your mind is Grave Digger, you know? And you're like, oh, you think of the guy who drives Grave Digger. I don't know who it is, but I think of that team, you know, that, that I think of Monster Jam, I think of Rodozer. I think of the four or five, like, yeah. powerhouses that really carry Monster Jam. Like, if I were to say Southern Rock Racing to you, Tim who, Cameron. Tim Cameron. Yeah. See, for me, it goes, like, I think of back talking about just being a fan yeah i think of plowboy i think of screaming blue yeah you know yeah. like that's almost personalities in that industry yeah um and those are to me those are those are one step above where tim is right now where tim is still active those are those are like like uh like the hall of fame legends guys you know if you have like a legends 
class. Well, it's it's that you know Tim Cameron is is the driver, right? But mm -hmm. he has had so many different vehicles. It's yeah. hard to associate that Grave Digger thing. Yeah, yeah. But you think Bobby Tanner, you think it's Scream Blue. Screaming Blue. Yeah. You know, and you've got that staple. Even That's if true. it, even if they look slightly different but similar, like the Plowboy has had different um, iterations, but yeah. it's the same car. Yeah. Know so you thing. know, I mean, there's there's that too. I don't know, man. It's it's so interesting to watch as a fan. Mm -hmm. You know, like my personal opinion, I truly enjoy sitting on a hillside and watching a rock bouncer race. Last this weekend, last weekend was the first time I've been to one probably a year. I missed it. It's great. It's so much fun. Yeah. And um, the recovery. I mean, even the recovery took just a little while, but it was still, dude. It was great. I had a fun time watching it. And um, I'm gonna try to go to Win Rock at the end of the month and. Go see those because that's an even better spectacle in terms of seating and things like that. I don't. I, well, think, it's, I think it's bright, and I, I, I. It's interesting that you mentioned you enjoy going to this because I had there was a debate recently about the live feed and the videos mm -hmm. versus the attendance and stuff like that. Sure. And you know, as a company, I as a sponsor, being you know invested in a series, you want it to reach as many people as possible. Sure. So I'm a proponent of the live feed. You yeah, know, get, I, get am, it, I am too. Get it out there, yeah. you know, share it, grow it, that kind of thing. But at the same time, you cannot appreciate a, an event unless you go to it, like fully. A hundred percent agree. I mean, there's something about, there's, there's a sense of urgency there. Mm -hmm. There's there's butterflies in the morning when you hear all the engines roar. Oh, yeah. And they're all in, sitting in line and you yeah. don't know what's going to happen on the hill. Like, you don't experience that on the live feed. No. But I am thankful for the live feed because it reaches people that wouldn't otherwise even know about it. It's the funnel. Agreed. Yes. And, and I think I think translating, I think, I think what Southern Rock needs to do now is figure out how to translate the viewers to people that can actually be in there. I don't know what you do. I think parks, I think it falls a lot on parks. Uh, like Mid-America sets the new standard. They've got like free beer on weekends. That's and, ridiculous. Which is insane. Uh, but they've got like pools and a concert and drag strips. And it, it really is like, uh, hey, we're going to an amusement park for the weekend. Not we're just going to go, you know, sit in our lawn chair. Well, and, and, you know, and, and years ago, that's what it kind of was, too, because mm -hmm. you didn't have all of these options. Yeah. Off-roading has grown so much in the last 10 years. Yeah. And it's it's partly due to because of the rock bouncing. People saw it on YouTube. Yeah. You know, we can we can thank Mad Ram 11 and Busted Knuckles for, right. for a lot of that growth. And people are like, hey, I want to do that. And now it's now it's huge. But um, used to, you know, you had these 20 guys that were racing. You had these 500 people that came to watch the race. And then when the race was over at 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, those 500 people went trail riding in that new park that they'd never been to. It's true. You know, you just, you, you don't see that anymore. Now the events are all day long. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole bunch of variables that there evolve is. There over is. time. You it's know? a complicated question. These guys, these guys have a lot of homework to do to yeah. figure out what the direction they want it to go. But I'm excited to see whatever they figure out because yeah. I'm, I'm going to be there no matter what. So yeah. I want to go see it. Me too. Me too. Okay. Two hours, 15 minutes. God, really? Yeah. Does that I'm, work? I'm sorry for <laughs> you. No, 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 no. That's I good. That's great, That's good. That's great, man. Listen to this. No, you know, that's great. Ramble on. Maybe this will be like the part two, part three, you know, we'll, section. We'll see. I, I personally, I may, I'm probably just going to drop it all in one, man. Let people enjoy it as they go. But uh, anything else? Closing words? Anything like that? Man, I appreciate you having me on here and letting me ramble for what I enjoy. And, you know, Dude, you're the man. You're Ricky B. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, cool. We'll go ahead and end it here. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, have a good weekend. Just like that.